Good evening again, everyone, and welcome to the first work in progress. So far, uh, we're just waiting for the second presenter, Dr. Paolo Bolaños, and the moment he's in, we'll be starting with the first work in progress. For now, while we're still waiting, may we please remind everyone to please edit their username under the participant section by Zoom book, and then replace your name with your actual name so that we can address you properly during the Q&A portion of the work in progress. And please make sure that you place yourself on mute while our presenters are discussing their drafts and their work in progress papers so that there will be no interruptions. Thank you. Please stand by.
Good evening again, everyone, and welcome to the first in uh, welcome to the first work in progress. And thank you for giving your time to attend and participate in this first session that we have, wherein some of our department members and also our graduate school students will be presenting their drafts in their researches or their specializations or their interested works. Uh, the work in progress involves the presentation of these people who are selected in a specific schedule po to present the research po. And then for this day, we have two presenters. Um, the first one is Dr. Job Jim S. Aguas, PhD. And the title of his paper will be Towards a Christian Anthropology. So it will be replaced by that one. It will be his research paper with the Center for Theology, Religious Studies, and Ethics. And our second presenter for today will be Dr. Paolo A. Bolaños, PhD. And the title of Dr. Paolo Bolaños' paper is Education as an Ethics of Thinking. But before we proceed, uh, I would just like to present something in relation to our policies on safe spaces. Okay, can everyone see the document po? Okay, thank you, Paul, for confirming. So the policies on safe spaces as defined, safe space is a place or environment in which a person or category of people can feel confident that they will not be exposed to discrimination, criticism, harassment, or any other emotional or physical harm. The Department of Philosophy commits itself in providing safe spaces for its faculty members, students, and guests. As such, the following policies are put in place. Uh, number one, commitment to recognize the individual gender preferences of its members. Number two, commitment to speak with prudence. And number three, commitment to act according to stature. So if ever uh, teachers and students are expected to act in accordance to RA 11313 or the Safe Spaces Act, an act defining gender-based sexual harassment in streets, public spaces, workplaces, and educational or training institutions. So this will be one of the policies that we will be implementing when, in every work in progress that we will be having. Okay, given that, uh, we may now proceed with our first presenter, Dr. Joe G. Aguas. And again, his paper entitled Towards a Christian Anthropology. Welcome, Dr. Aguas. Thank you very much, Aldrin. Uh, I will just share my... I'll share my screen. So, I don't know. Uh, can you see my... My screen now. <clears throat> yes, Kodo. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to the this first session of the work in progress. And thank you for attending this first session together with uh, uh, my, my co-presenter is Dr. Bolaños. Uh, he will be presenting his paper after my presentation. So. To our students, uh, thank you for attending. And to our non-members non of the Department of Philosophy, our visitors, our guests, uh, welcome to this session. I hope that uh, you will gain something from this presentation. Uh, just some uh, words about the change in my topic. Uh, actually, I've been working on on two papers. Uh, the first one is on institution uh, devaluation of institutionalized religion. I submitted that to a journal, but uh, it's still under review. I have already received some reviews, and so I'm working on. But uh, the second paper that I'm writing on uh, is. Uh, this one towards a Christian anthropology. This is my research paper with the Center for Theology and Religious Studies and Ethics of the University of Santo Tomas. And uh, I just deemed it uh, proper that I present this in the work in the uh, work in progress because this is my research that I'm doing with the Center of Research of UST. No, in, because the other paper is an individual, I mean, it's a, it's a, 
it's a it's a self initiated uh, research. Uh, while this one is this paper is the one that uh, I have to finish and submit to to the center. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is already a rather long paper. This is already sixty pages uh, because my in, my intention is to publish this as a book. This is actually a book. Uh, it's composed of initially uh, 10 chapters, but I have already included another chapter which will serve as a kind of introduction or a kind of conclusion to, to, the, whole, to the whole thing. I will not be reading the, the entire paper, that's 60 pages. Uh, this is almost uh, 30 plus thousand. the outlines of the chapters and then I will focus on the last two chapters at least we can so we can have some some uh, you know some topics for for discussion okay so all right <clears throat> so the type of this paper actually uh, as I've said this is going to be uh, to be a book you know uh, is towards a Christian anthropology. Uh, this is a short introduction. Within the landscape of philosophy in today's world, we find a vibrant mix of philosophies that offer different analysis and critiques of contemporary social, cultural, and political issues. This is very promising for philosophy. At the beginning of the 20th century, the focus of philosophy was more on the human person and society, especially as society modernized itself. Some contemporary philosophers were critical of the Christian philosophical traditions and perspective. Some, in fact, were against religion, specifically Christianity. However, there are occasional voices of the Christian perspectives, Jacques Maritain, Carol Wittler, who were students of the philosophy of St. Thomas. They continue of the teaching of the angelic doctor by reinterpreting and renewing our understanding So even though I mean these thinkers like Saint Augustine and Saint Thomas Aquinas, and renewed by contemporary thinkers like Jacques Maritain and Carol Witiwa. <laughs> Now, one particular subject matter or issue that is very relevant today is the human person, particularly the dignity of the human person. And uh, just a comment on this. Uh, this is one topic that I've been really uh, right. Me that while doing this paper, this Christian anthropology, I just realized that many of the Uh, particularly human dignity. So that's the overarching theme of this, uh, of this whole work on Christian anthropology. The way we understand and treat the human person affects or influences our view and understanding of the society, culture, and even religion, and the many other issues attached to the human person. There are, of course, many anthropologies or interpretations of the human person. And aside from these different anthropologies, there are prevailing anthropological issues and problems that surround the understanding of the human person. The reductionist positions about the nature of the human person, namely materialism, individualism, and totalitarianism. Materialism considers man only as a material or a physical being devoid of spirituality. Individualism takes man only as a separate subjugate. Totalitarianism ignores the freedom of man and considers man only as a part that serves the interests of a totalitarian regime. Such redux reductionist positions dehumanize and violate the very dignity of the human person. Aside from these redux reductionist positions, moral relativism and emotivism undermine the objectivity of moral values and the role of reason and will in man's decision-making. Some anthropologists have questioned man's recognition 
and relation with God, undermining his faith in the divine being. There are issues about personal identity, which blurs the genuine identity of the one person based on being, on being created in the image of God and his God-given and natural sexual identity. There is a problem of egoistic and utilitarian interpretation of love and human sexuality, which reduces love and sexuality to mere generating relationship. And then, of course, there is the denigration of human labor, which alienates human labor and the worker from the product of his work. Moreover, uh, there are issues about the final destination or ultimate goal of man, questioning man's desire for eternal happiness. These issues and questions are not entirely new. They are, again, at the forefront because of the secularistic and individualistic tendencies that prevail in the modern world. It is certainly challenging to address all these problems and issues. Although a critical stance against these different anthropologies is possible by addressing the problems and issues one by one, I think the more appropriate approach is to go back to our own Christian roots and perspective and relearn, reintroduce, and renew our understanding and appreciation of our Christian tradition, teachings, and ideals. What is needed, I think, is to highlight the Christian perspectives of the human calls for a reintroduction of Christian anthropology. This Christian anthropology is inspired by the great thinkers of the Christian traditions from the Middle Ages down to contemporary time. Therefore, in this paper, I will work or focus on reintroducing Christian anthropology based on the thoughts of St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Jacques Maritain, and Carol Vitiwa. Incidentally, three, my four uh, inspirations, uh, influences, of my Christian, uh, uh, Christian understand, uh, my Christian perspective about philosophy. So they serve as some kind of a, a backbone or you can say a foundation of my philosophical views you know, or my Christian philosophical, Christian philosophical views. So since I started uh, writing about philosophy, I have always been inspired by these four and uh, Christian thinkers, uh, which represents the uh, two from the medieval, uh, of course, St. Augustine is from the patristic era, St. Thomas, and then contemporary uh, Christian philosophers, Jacques Maritain, Iwa. Uh, incidentally, my, my undergrad thesis, or my latest licensure thesis, was on Jacques Maritain, uh, philosophy of history. And then, of course, my dissertation, my MA and my dissertation was on Karun Baitiwa. All right, so <clears throat> let me just, uh, you know, um, course, uh, present these 10 chapters. Uh, I will not be reading them. I mean, I, I'll just be uh, mentioning the different parts of this chapter. So chapter one will be about the human person as a created being, as an imago dei. Here I started discussing about the notion of being. Uh, 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 first, I, I highlighted the biblical basis of man as an imago dei. Okay. Uh, my, my, my inspiration or my influence here, my, my source here, are uh, Karol Wojtyla or John Paul II. Uh, I have read the, the I mean, I, I base much of this on his theology of the body. Uh, so I, I discussed that. And then, of course, I, well, I've been quoting from St. Thomas Aquinas. In, by the way, um, some of these chapters have already been uh, published in separate articles. So what I'm doing is try to put together all my, my papers. I, and I just realized that if you are focused on, on one thing, uh, although you write different papers, but there is always that uh, overarching uh, theme on of the papers that you that you always write. It's it's it's, it's almost uh, subconsciously uh, you write about this paper, and then when you when you put them together, you realize oh. Uh, on the human person based on 
uh, Aynas, Waitiwa, um, philosophers there. I, I discussed the human person based on St. Thomas, uh, and then man as a being in microcosm. Here, I, I have to go back to the roots, I mean, to the, to the, to the ancient roots of the notion of being. So I go back to, to Aristotle in uh, Aristotle, uh, buying this concept of being to go back to uh, the definition. Uh, so then I discuss, uh, so if you can see, I have already, I have the footnotes there. Uh, that means that I've been working on this for, for quite some time. All right. Uh, okay, so this is a long, rather long chapter no? there. And then chapter two is uh, about the human person as a psychosomatic being, a psychosomatic. So man as, in, as a being in Imago Dei. And then chapter two, I focus on the human person as a psychosomatic being. So I discuss here uh, body and soul. Again, I go back to Aristotle uh, and then discuss the theory of hylomorphism and then uh, discuss body and soul, uh, a combination of Aristotle and St. Thomas. Discuss the different faculties of man and then that's it. Uh, I, I still have to, you know, I. I it's it's not a finished it's not a finished chapter yet so I'm still working on on some of the parts of this of this. It's not just a being, man. It's not just a an imago dei. Man is not just a psychosomatic being, a body and soul being. He is also. I discussed uh, the nature of sense knowledge and the sensing faculties. Uh, put just this is more, most, more or less a kind of a combination of psychology. Intellectual knowledge, discuss the rational faculties. Uh, this is not a complete uh, chapter yet. No? I'm still working on this. Uh, and then chapter uh, focus on his interiority or in the in uh, I have to connect this concept of the person uh, of in the contemporary, in the existential, you know, in existential philosophy. Okay, so what, although it, this is Christian, I always I, I, I connect that to uh, contemporary readings or contemporary uh, philosophies of the about the human person. But I always uh, put there the Christian perspective. Okay, so I like like uh, I, I discuss the human person as an existential subject, but what does it mean to be an existential subject? From so I, I am I'm I take a lot of ideas from the existential. Connect that to Christian notion of uh, being a subject of interiority of personality. So here we relied on the tax Moritan. the idea of uh, Carol Vitio about person. Okay, so uh, discuss their man as a sui juris, uh, consciousness and human action. So here I go. I
I combined St. Thomas and Jacques Maritain to explain this idea of man as an individual. Uh, some of these parts of the chapter can actually be, you know, developed into one, one, one paper. No? But since I'm, I'm putting together so much material, so I have just have to uh, be conscious of the number of pages that I that I consume or or that I you know yeah consume in in a particular chapter so that it will not be you know uh, I have to be conscious of the balance of the of the pages. You know? Then I discuss self determination. Okay, and then chapter five is about the human person as a believing subject. So it's it's. The human person is not just a existential subject, he's also a believing subject. So I focus now in this chapter on man's faith, faith in man's relationship with God. Okay, so uh, I discuss about faith, I discuss about man as a praying or worshiping subject. Okay, uh, this is not yet fully developed, but you see here that I still have to. Uh, write about ma faith in man's relation with God. And I still have to write about prayer and communication with God. Okay, so this is truly a, a work in progress. No? But uh, I'm happy that I have so far covered many of the, I mean, uh, many, many of my projected, projected uh, uh, topics or subtopics that I need to include in, in each of these of these chapters, right? So uh, that's just uh, two things maybe, uh, but I still have to include, to add more to this because this is just three topics to under this chapter. So that's still, I'm still reading no, on reading on this, on this topic. And then uh, the human person as a moral agent, uh, this is more on ethics. No? I focus here on law and conscience. Uh, so focus, uh, on Christian ethics, in uh, it's it's Christian ethics, but of course, uh, in connection with uh, the human person, right? So I discuss here uh, moral agency. Again, I go back to Saint Thomas and and later on Carl Wojty were here. Uh, so I discuss uh, experience of efficacy and subjectiveness. This is Wojty and then uh, the personal value of the action. That's Wojtyla, of course. Uh, norms of morality, law and conscience. I go back to St. Thomas. Uh, general law, that's St. Thomas. Um, then virgin happiness. Uh, I combine St. Thomas and St. Augustine here. Okay? But virgin happiness. Uh, so there. And then I... Just, I just want to highlight the uh, the virtues, the, the the Christian virtues. I, I have I still have to develop this part of the of the paper. Will and morality go back to Augustine uh, and for Saint Thomas. And the determinants of morality go back to Saint Thomas about his ethics. Um, the the parts of the chapters, uh, although it's already there, but I still have to to. Uh, edit this and maybe rearrange the the sequencing so that there is some kind of a continuity of the of the whole discussion. So the challenge here is to make the chapter as as coherent, as orderly as possible. It's like uh, if I'm going to use this book when I teach uh, like a, a course in. Uh, Christian anthropology, then the sequencing of the chapters should, you know, be consistent and coherent, one leading to another, to the other, then to the other, and to the other. So that's the, that's what is at the back of my mind while uh, composing, uh, constructing this, uh, this outline. And then chapter seven, uh, the human person as a sexual and loving being. So man is a, uh, is a worshiping subject, but man is also a loving and a sexual being, right? So again, I, I, here I rely heavily on on Carol Vitiwa. You know? So I discuss human love and sexuality. Uh, I discuss about uh, conjugal love and marriage, uh, and then 
biblical account of marriage. Uh, this part here, I have developed already this because I have already written a uh, several articles on the theology of the body, on marriage, uh, on love. So more or less, halos uh, completo na ito, this part of the book. Uh, all right. So as, again, some of these have already been published. So what I'm going to do when I publish this, I have to put kind of a footnote there that this is a revised uh, version of a paper published in this, something like that. No? Uh, you, we have to, I have to acknowledge kung saan ko ito udang na publish no, uh, but it will not be an exact, the exact paper it's because of course if I have published this paper two, two years ago uh, and considering that I'm doing this as part of a, an entire book about Christian anthropology I have to revise it in a, such a way that it will not be some kind of an independent paper. No? So it, it has to uh, follow the flow of my follow the flow of my discussion. So I have to revise the paper so that it fits this part fits in into the whole whole project. Okay, <clears throat> and then uh, chapter eight, I now I discuss human person as a worker or the dignity of labor. Uh, this is one very important. Uh, topic for me because sometimes in, in anthropology we always just focus on the previous topics that I have mentioned. Man as an external subject, man as a loving subject, man as a being, man as like this. But uh, part of being a human person, part of Christian anthropology is to recognize the fact that man is also a laborer. He is a worker. All right? uh, he's a working being, you know, a laborer. So I discussed here, the nature of human labor, and then uh, man as a subject of work. So in this chapter, I relied heavily on the social teachings of the church. Okay? You can see here that I have, uh, I have long quotations from, papal, from the papal encyclicals. To, aside from the philosophy of work, I have to also uh, highlight also the teachings of the church about, about work, okay? So you can see here that I, I discussed the dignity of labor, uh, the rights of the worker, and then here uh, some papal teachings on labor and the dignity of the worker. So I still have to discuss this, although I have already have the, the, the quotations from the different encyclicals, like from the Rerum the Barum of Leo the Thirteenth, So I already have the significant parts uh, of that uh, encyclical uh, discussing about this uh, dignity of the worker. No? So I have here, then uh, Pius X, Quadrigismo Ano. Uh, now the reason why I have this uh, topic here, because I've been, I have taught uh, business ethics for for quite some time, for a long time in, in commerce and in, in the College of Accountancy. So I have all these materials about, uh, about labor, about work, the dignity of work, dignity of labor. So I have an entire, uh, I have an entire lecture notes on business ethics, Christian business ethics. So just pick out some of this and then put it there and then I will just, just discuss this so that it, it fits into the whole uh, flow of the discussion. Uh, so there, John the 23rd, Mata et Magestra, uh, Laborem Exercens, uh, they, they all talk about the dignity of, of, lab, of man as a worker. Because the dignity, yes, I discuss about human dignity, but sometimes one aspect of human dignity that is very important but hardly mentioned in some anthropology is that man is a worker and uh, there is human, there's the dignity of human labor. All right. So, and then church documents for teachers and labor, like uh, Gaudium in Spes. Uh, Gaudium in Spes is one of my, one, one, one very important document in the church. That uh, any serious Christian, I mean, student, stu student of Christian philosophy or Christian teachings should, should read. All right. And then, uh, here I try to develop this this idea of 
towards a civilization of work. No? A civilization work. Civilization in which work is a dominant social and economic category. Okay. Uh, that work is not just, you know, work is not, should not be considered only as kind of economic, in terms of economic. Uh, it's work that gives us that, that you know, that, uh, uh, that provides us uh, to really work for our dignity, that to, you know, uh, to express our, our dignity, to ex also uh, to express our humanity. Uh, I, I think I failed to mention that, of course, I will be talking here about, although I mentioned that in the, in the earlier part of this chapter about uh, alienation of work. All right, so that's it. Uh, and then chapter nine is about the human person as a social being, fellow men, family, and community. Uh, so I talked, I discussed here about the community. Now, uh, I when one once when I finish this, I think that this chapter, I don't know, I may I may put this chapter ahead of the other chapters, no? So because I think this is one, this one should be before uh maybe before uh love, no? Maybe I have to put that or after love, then social being before I discuss about. Uh, work, no. So again, uh, this is not yet final. Uh, these are initial, you know, uh, uh, sequencing of the chapter. So I discuss here about intersubjectivity and sociality. Well, I have written so much about this topic, so uh, more or less uh, complete the young discussion to dito. Uh, common good. Again, I relied heavily on Boitiwa here. Uh, notion of community. And then the notion of neighbor, uh, the Good Samaritan is one of my favorite examples. Uh, actually, uh, Saint John Paul or Boitiwa used this example in his uh, in his uh, book, the authentic and unauthentic attitudes of participation. So there you are, uh, and that that still need to be to be polished uh, or expanded. Because there, I, I have some. Uh, I have a lot of things to say about, about this, this chapter, about this topic rather. And then the last chapter before the, before the, before the, uh, uh, before the conclusion is this. Actually, this is the last chapter, uh, but I added another chapter as a, some kind of a conclusion. And this is about the human person as a temporal and its ultimate goal, transcendence and eternal happiness. And this one, I will have to read para meron naman tayong ma-discuss. No? Of course, you can ask questions about the other, other chapters, but I will be reading this, this part. Hope, I hope I have enough time. Alvin, how many, how many minutes do I have more? Aldrin? Ah, yes, Doc. Uh, uh, ilang minuto pa ako? I think, Doc, since there are only two presenters and I think we're until nine po, you still have enough time pa po. Oh, hanggang nine pa tayo? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay, so I will read this part no, about uh, the human person as a temporal, as temporal and his ultimate goal. Uh, this is the last chapter actually. Pero yung susunod, parang yun ang aking conclusion. Uh, sagot dun sa, 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 ano ko, sa introduction ko. The human person is not an infinite being. We will not live forever. Sooner or later, our life will come to an end. But man's ultimate goal and destination is not here in the present life. As a being created by God, the final destination is eternal happiness in the company of God. Man always desires happiness and he aspires for happiness in this world. However, according to St. Augustine and the other Christian philosophers, man's ultimate destination is God. And that means the spiritual and the transcendent. St. Augustine insists, that although man achieves a certain degree of happiness in the physical things, for they are a reflection of God's goodness, man cannot conceive of true happiness without the permanence that only God can assure. It is impossible to attain true happiness here in this world, for the world is finite. It can only provide man with things that are temporary and fleeting. 
God as a supreme object is the natural goal of man's activity, the ultimate resting place of man's love. Since man's desire for happiness is a love of God, no created good can capture man's heart except by presenting a reflection of the absolute good and portraying the continence of God. St. Augustine stresses that through its creative act, man's will receives direct participation in the subsisting goodness, God. And it is for this reason that the movement of love can find repose only in God. As St. Augustine said in the Confessions, my heart is restless until it rests in thee. Human finitude and temporality. The human person is not an infinite being. We will never live forever. Uh, I, repeat, I think I have repeated this now. Although it will come in the future, it cannot be relegated to the future because it is a constant present. And nobody can take our place in our death. According to the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, man is a temporal being. And nothing makes us realize this fact of our existence than the fact that we are going to die. We are a being towards death. As soon as we are born, we are already a being towards death. Heidegger describes man as Dasein. The term Dasein is a combination of two German terms, Da, which means there, and Sein, which means being. But being is not taken as a noun, but rather as a verb, to be. So when the two are joined, it literally means being there or to be there. So it was what is in man, so, so, so that man is a Dasein or being there. So, oh, sorry. So if what is, there's some, some mistakes here. According to Heidegger, to be there or being there signifies our being in the world, that we exist in the world. So man as a Dasein is a being in the world. By being in the world, we exist together with other beings, which Heidegger calls entities. And these entities are also in the world. But their being in the world is different from our being in the world because Dasein can reflect. As Dasein, we can reflect, question, meditate about ourselves and our being here in the world because we have our consciousness. The other entities are not capable of doing this because they don't have consciousness. As we inquire or ask about our being in the world, one condition that we realize about ourself is that we are temporal, which means that our existence is related to time. Our existence is temporal. According to Heidegger, temporality is the way we see time. This is different from the view of time as being linear, series of past, present, future. Temporality is to see these moments of time, past, present, future as ecstasy. Ecstasy is standing outside of the self. This means that these moments of time can be a moment wherein while we are in the present, we can also project ourselves to feel thinking of our possibilities or what we can become. We can also think of the past and see ourselves as connected to the past and see our place in the history of our generation. Our future will be will, with all the possibilities and the past, with all its decisions and actions, and our present moments are parts of our being temporal. All these are possible because the moments of time as present, past, and future are not linear. What reveals to us this temporality of our existence is death. And Heidegger's analysis of death has nothing to do with the biological, when, when life lives and when death begins, begins. It's not concerned with any psychological account of death. Uh, it's not concerned with theological questions. It's not about our moral or ethical attitudes towards death, etc. So I will skip this. I will just skip this part here. Um, the reason why I discussed uh, temporality here of Heidegger, especially when he said that uh, our possibilities, our one of our possibilities, death is to connect this to uh, to the future of our life. That yes, we are being unto death. But there is more to death. There is more to life after death. Right? And that's what I'm trying to, to develop here. No? Uh, although I think I, it, it took me uh, several lines to make that connection. I have uh, probably I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, uh, 
out in uh, with you or for you i realized i have to do this remove this then discuss this no it, that's it's a good thing about reading the, your papers again and again and again no so <clears throat> To wish to continue living, but we will all face our death. Our existence as good be as human beings is rich in paradoxes and antinomies. Those things are mutually incompatible. There is a good and evil, happiness, etc. And according to the German philosopher Karl Jaspers, our existence is limited by impenetrable boundaries or boundary situations, and one of these is our finitude. We are temporal. We are also finite. Uh, okay, but according to Jasper's death also elevates our spirit to a higher level because it emphasizes the urgency of living authentically without postponement. Because I am aware of all the time, uh, aware all the time of the inevitability of death, that I will die sooner or later, then I have to live a meaningful life and that there is no time to postpone it. I have to be aware of my future possibilities and cease to take advantage of present moment and live a meaningful life. The awareness of the inevitability of death gives us courage and integrity. It gives us authentic perspective of the things that matter most. And then um, I, I will have to add another paragraph here. Again, as I've said, uh, now you realize that you have to give a kind of a transition into the next. That uh, yeah, when, you, when man realizes that he must live a meaningful life, but the meaning is not always uh, based on like giving meaning to your present life. You also have to look to the future, to look beyond death. And in Christian, in Christian anthropology, what is beyond death would be the next life. Right? All right, so now I, I discuss man. Now I try to connect this with uh, the philosophy of St. Augustine. Man for Augustine is an intermediate creature between the angels, a rational animal and ordered by living pro loving providence of a personal God. The two characteristic faculties of man are the intellect and will. The end of the intellect is the possession of the immutable uh, truth, while the end of the will is the union with the immutable good. The truth and the good are united into one being of God. So for Augustine, the union and possession of God is the ultimate destiny of man, and man, in his quest to attain destiny, is guided by divine providence. However, man is a being of flesh and bone and exists and lives in a space-time continuum. Man does live in the world. He is also man in this world. Okay. Uh, then in this part, I will try to connect that to the philosophy of to to what Heidegger is talking about, that we are in this, in this world. No? The goodness of creation is also the goodness of God. But for Augustine, although man is in this world because of his corporeality, uh, because of his temporality, he's not just a man of this world. Because of his spiritual nature, he will, no? he will not find the ultimate fulfillment or happiness in the temporal world or secular world. The secular affairs of man are mere manifestations of his fundamental reality. The state and desire of his, of his soul for happiness. But it is the spiritual in man that gives integrity and meaning to his personal life and human destiny. The passing events of this world are mere prefigurations and symbols to prepare man for his eternal destiny. Therefore, for St. Augustine, it is the divine towards his ultimate end in destiny, which is heavenly happiness. The divine image is the compass of human life. However, all of the first man, his divine image was shattered by sin and man became lost and ice disoriented. St. Augustine compares man's spiritual disorientation to a group of wanderers who wanted to return to their homeland. So he writes, suppose, and this is a quotation from Augustine. I have put this in a, in a, a black form. Suppose we are in a strange country and could not live happily away from our fatherland and wishing to put an end to our misery, determined to return home. Conveyance, either by land or water, in order to reach the fatherland, where our enjoyment is to commence. But the beauty of the country to which we pass 
and the very pleasure of the motion charm our heart and turning these things which we ought to objects of enjoyment we become to hasten to the end of our journey and becoming engrossed in fictitious delight our thoughts are the from that home whose delights would make us truly happy. So like wanderers, man seeks to return to his fatherland or homeland, which is the kingdom of God. Man's life is a spiritual journey that is often distracted by the things of this world, and he is continually entrapped in its temporal and material grandeur. One of the spiritual journey is the Would be so absorbed in this passing grandeur of the secular world, the point of loving the creatures more than the creator, but knowing that the material and temporal grandeur of the secular world is nothing but an reflection of God. Man's excessive love for this world is and the destination of man's spiritual journey is a source of true happiness. Striving after God is therefore the desire of beatitude. The attainment of God is beatitude itself. As God is the highest beatitude of happiness, a man serves as the fundamental criterion for moral salvation. Virtue is an intellectual and moral purification through which our intellect and will are a sensible object. Man cannot ascend to God if he is attached to worldly things. He must abandon all attachment to worldly happiness. The virtue are thus important, for they are those that temper the worldly desires of man through the virtues of man. man through the virtues, man is able to detach himself from worldly uh, pleasures. St. Augustine is telling us that while we fall in love with the temporal order and material happiness, we need to realize that this is not our final destination. The ultimate end of our journey is union with God. What is to avoid the destruction of this world and focus on the final end of our journey? I will skip some parts here. So, is the being where the spiritual and physical and components are integrated? So, I think I have uh, repeated this. So I will skip some parts here. Uh, then uh, I, I says that all action aimed at certain good, and he identifies the ultimate end with happiness. Man nature desires happiness, but in spirit while in the transcendent. I think I have already mentioned this. You know, so I will skip some of parts here. So we can have more time for discussion. Anyway, now this is my. This is uh, I added this chapter uh, from my original outline because I wanted to uh, sort of apply what the is presently happening in the modern world. No? And in this page, this is actually a paper that I have in, I think in one of our uh, Thomasian philosophers convention uh, this is part of that part of our paper upholding that's the overarching uh, theme of the of the whole paper the Gaudium is best acknowledges the ambivalent condition of the modern world there are profound and rapid changes in many aspects of human life uh, spreading all across the world, science, medicine, telecommunications, engineering, etc. These changes are the energies of man and have also affected cultural and social transformation, which also affected the religious aspects of human life. Uh, skip that. We have never experienced such mass many aspects of the Somewhat challenging our old belief and but
concept of reality to a more dynamic, evolutionary one. But as a consequence, there has a problems series of series as numerous as can be called. Man can has transformed the face of the earth and so on and so forth. No? These changes have affected everybody, individuals, and results, traditional communities, such families, clans, tribes, villages, stemming from social parts, uh, uh, experience more thorough changes every day. So uh, this is a description of the of the modern world. So the changes in the modern world have also posed challenges on our attitudes, values, and religious beliefs. The change in attitudes and in human structures frequently calls accepted values into question, especially among young peoples. So these new conditions have impact on our religious beliefs, while our critical ability to distinguish a magical and superstitious view of the world have purified our beliefs, giving us a more vivid sense of God. Conflicting forces have proliferated in our society and have given us positive and negative results. Okay. So at the center of this transformation, the agent and recipient of all this advancement is man himself. It is man who benefits from all this progress and development. However, we also see him as the perpetrator and victim of all these tensions, inequalities, injustices, and disturbances. And it's a crisis condition like this. What is violated is the dignity of the human person. Man in the modern world shows himself at once powerful and weak, capable of the noblest deeds or the foulest. Before him is a lies, before him lies the path to freedom or to slavery, to progress or to retreat, to community or hatred. So uh, I will uh, end this with these four uh, sort of uh, Based on the government's best uh, uh, so principles, no, how to uh, uphold the dignity of of man in the modern world, no, based on a Christian perspective or Christian anthropology, upholding the value of, re of reason and wisdom. So, uh, so I developed that in the earlier in the in the earlier chapters. I talk about uh, reason, reason and wisdom. So it's like trying to trying to put together the things I have discussed in the previous chapters. Uh, so I talk here about man as unity of body and soul. Um, so in, in our modern era, need such wisdom more than the past eras. So the discoveries and progress that man has attained can be further humanized. Our future could be com compromised unless wiser men are forthcoming. So while reason allows us to progress, it is wisdom that will harm humanize the progress that we attain so that our future is secured. And then forming rightful conscience and authentic freedom. So I discussed freedom before and I discussed conscience before. So now I have to put them together you know, as part of how we can deal with, you know, uh, in the uh, uphold dignity, human person in the modern world, right? So forming rightful conscience and authentic freedom. Uh, I will not be reading the whole thing here. And then, a call to communion with God. Uh, it's already seven o'clock, so I have to finish by seven. And then the last part here is about promoting social responsibilities. So our time, in our time, human interdependence and interaction have grown rapidly over the whole world. And because of this, the common good, this, those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members to attain their own fulfillment takes an increasingly universal character. This involves recognition of the rights and duties with respect to the human, human race. Every social group, therefore, must consider and respect the needs and legitimate aspirations of other groups and the general welfare of the entire human family. Social responsibility calls for equality and respect of the rights of others, especially the right to life and to decent living. But man can scarcely arrive at the needed sense of responsibility unless his living conditions allow him to become conscious of his dignity, to raise his dignity depending, spending himself for God and for others. So I tried to connect this to what I discussed about the human uh, 
uh, about human labor. Freedom acquires a new strength by contrast when man consents to the unavoidable requirement of social life, takes on the manifold demands of human partnership, and commits himself to the service of the human community. So that's all that I have for you uh, for my presentation. Uh, sorry if I, I talk very fast. I have to uh, finish within my, my time limit so that we can also have time for, for a discussion. So thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you, Dr. Aguas, for that extensive lecture and explanations. Okay, uh, to everyone, the floor is now open for your questions for Dr. Aguas. You may click the raise hand button uh, for via the Zoom link if you have your questions and clarifications. So let's start with Dr. Paula Bulanos. Sir Pao. Uh, uh, hello, um, Aldine. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Aguas, uh, thank you for your presentation. I don't have a question. I, I just like to, uh, uh, you know, to tell everybody that um, we'd like to have a more organic and uh, parang, uh, spontaneous and casual conversation. Uh, so uh, please, uh, when you uh, want to speak, speak or ask a question or you have any anything to contribute to the to the conversation please uh, uh raise your hand and open your microphone and your uh and your uh, uh camera so that we could see you no so that at least we could approximate the the uh face to face uh, uh encounter no yeah. so yun lang yun lang sabihin ko Altin, para mas organic and casual yung ating uh, uh conversation thank yeah. you Dr. Thank, thank thank you Dr. Pao. Okay, we have a question, I think, from uh, Mr. Beljun and Aya. Ah, yes, po. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Doc uh, Jovi. Um, my, I, I'm just wondering, po, if uh, uh, concerning the title uh, towards the uh, Christian anthropology, I'm just wondering if uh, why do you opt for such a title instead of, like, for example, uh, Christian towards Christian person or Christian human being. Um, so I'd just like to be enlightened uh, for the you know the choice of uh, words in the title instead of those that I mentioned. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Belgian. Actually, the title is uh, a working title. It's not the final title. Uh, it's, just, it's just for the paper to have a title. I mean, very general. Uh, I can just put that Christian anthropology or since I am trying to, uh, it's not really to develop Christian because there is already a, a kind of anthropology you know, based on Christian. So actually, nag-iisip pa rin ako ng magiging appropriate na title. Nasanay lang ako ng towards kasi parang yun ang gusto mong punterihin, di ba? Pero posibleng habang uh, iniisip mo kung paano ka makakarating doon, doon sa gusto mong i, you know, isulat, makakaisip ka ng siguro mas appropriate na title. Uh, medyo matagal pa naman ito. So, sa akin, gusto kong, al alam, alam mo yun, yung mag-germinate sa isip mo kung ano yung talaga magiging titulo habang ginagawa mo yung, yung papel mo. Uh, so, hindi pa siya talaga ano, yung final na na, na title. Um, it's a work at the same time uh, inisip ko rin kung ano title nun lang ay ethical theory and system. Uh, tapos habang sinusulat ko yon at bumabalik-balik sa sa pagsusulat ko, yung tema na yung ethics is about being good. ba? being yung good always connected with the happy life the good lives kaya naisip ko yung yun, the good and happy life so ganun yung proseso ng pag-iisip ko pagka nagsusulat ako ng ganito ng mahabang mga ano ng libro kahit na, na artikulo so hayaan ko lang na ano hayaan ko lang na uh, mag-develop yung isip ko and i appreciate yung ganitong klase ng discussion kasi Dito ko nakakuha ng 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 ideya din. No, yung mga kagaya niyo, yung mga suggestion mo. So, mamayang gabi pag 
pagkatapos ito, mag-iisip na ako niyan. Kung ano, ano ba yung over... Eh, kanina, lagi kong nababangit yung... Kaya dyan po the second, human person yung ginamit ko ron. Eh. Pero hindi natin alam, baka mamaya human person pa rin ang lumabas dyan. Depende dun sa magiging final na... Alam mo yun, yung takbo at saka yung magiging kung ano yung out, final outcome nung, nung libro ko. So, maraming salamat. Thank you, thank you, Doc. Malaking tulong sa akin yan. Okay. okay, thank you, Beljun. And thank you, Dr. Aguas. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Cortez. Go ahead, Dr. Cortez. Friends na lang, Aldrin. Sige <laughs> <laughs> mean, uh, Sir Joe. Yeah. Uh, kaya tumaas na rin ako ng kamay kasi connected na rin sa sinasabi ni Beljo yung aking uh, ano, uh, pinag-iisipan din dito na <clears throat> parang nang andating ng towards sa Christian anthropology parang, parang ano, uh, marami ba tayong Christian anthropologies? parang ganun ba? plural ba yung Christian anthropology na uh, po, uh, may na i-consider yung ano. Dahil uh, yun nga, yun nga isang tinatanong. Uh, uh, pag sinabi natin Christian anthropology, pwede rin pag-isipan sir eh, na ano eh, na siya ba ay more of a theological anthropology or a philosophical anthropology? Uh, pwede bang uh, banggitin dun sa, sa isusulat yung aklat o baka pwede mag, uh, mag-explore dun sa ano ba ang pagkakaiba ng philosophical anthropology sa theology. Tapos ano ba ang ginagawa ko dito sa aklat na mas malapit ba siya sa isang theological anthropology o sa isang philosophical anthropology? Uh, ang tinignan ko ba kay Jacques Maritain, kay Jean Paul at saka doon sa dalawa pa kay Sita Gassi kay Sita Thomas, yung bang part talaga ng philosophical o doon sa theological part? Yung mga ganong consideration na nakikita ko doon sa ano, nung uh, Uh, nakita ko yung uh, yung title na tapos uh, yun talagang malakas ang dating sa akin nung Christian anthropology na parang ano eh marami tayong pwedeng pamili ang Christian anthropologies na para bang hindi pa natin natutuklasan talaga itong Christian anthropology samantalang mukhang naitatak na to eh ano ta nasa Catholic uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church na to complete kumbaga kinumpleto na nung ano nung uh, nung ng Christ ng Catholicism. Tapos uh, siguro ang isa pa rin sir na pwedeng pag-isipan dito yung ano uh, pag sinabi ba natin Christian anthropology ay iba ba yun do sa Catholic anthropology? Kasi halimbawa bakit Catholic social encyclicals hindi tinawag na Christian social encyclicals? Yung ba mga ganung consideration din dahil baka halimbawa yung apat ay eh, talagang mga ano mga Katoliko talaga siguro hindi ko alam po kasi wala pa naman nung time sa ito mas wala pang ano wala pang protestant no so talagang christian pa lang talaga pero nung dumating na yung ano yung uh, protestantism baka meron din silang catholic anthropology uh, christian anthropology na hindi kapareho nung ano catholic anthropology so these things ba pwede pag-isipan din tingin ko mga points to ponder doon sa ano sa ginagawa yun lang sir thank you yeah Thank you, thank you, Franz. Actually, yung paggamit ko ng Christian talaga, matagal kong iniisip niya kasi uh, ako bilang student ng history ng, ano, ng philosophy, alam ko yun na nag-umpis ang Christian pero ngayon, di na basta Christian. Di ba? I mean, uh, nagdi-distinguish na tayo between Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. Pero ginagamit para natin yung Christian pagdating sa kahit Katoliko, Christian pa rin. No, so, andun yung nuances eh. So, ang actually ang inisip ko pwede kong gawin dito, uh, yun nga kailangan i-clarify ko 'yan sa ano sa introduction pa lang yung paggamit nung ano nung nung Christian na 'yan kasi matagal ko ring inano 'yan eh, so, uh, Christian. Eh yung mga Orthodox Christian pero hindi naman ito about Orthodox ano philosophy. Nung panahon nila Augustine at saka ni St. Thomas, yeah, Christian pero nagkaroon ng transition yan. Eh. Nung reformation, iba na. Di ba? Or even before uh, before Aquinas, na, nagkaroon na ng schism. 
yung east saka yung west. So, kailangan ko i-consider yun. Actually, inisip ko sa introduction ko ilalagay yun pagka para i-clarify. And then, uh, yung subtitle, actually, ang uh, yung unang naisip, nung, when I proposed this sa ano, dun, di ba, gagawa, umaga tayong crisis proposal, kasi second year ko nang ginagawa ito, nung first year, uh, isang taon na ako, and then, tinutuloy ko lang ngayon. Ang unang titulo ko dito ay uh, pabago-bago actually title ko sa mga proposal sa research proposal ko. Uh, Reintod... Ano? Uh, re, re, reintroducing Christian Christian Anthropology. Parang ganyan. Uh, mm-hmm. Pero sabi ko, pag nireintroduce ko, ano, ano naman i-introduce ko ulit dito? Eh, sila ano rin naman ang sinusundan ko. No? So, actually, ang Uh, napupunta ako doon sa position na lal- yung Christian anthropology hindi ko nalalagyan ng A o DA para siya yung magiging secondary title pero meron ako dapat na primary title talaga na yung, alam mo yun ang main title ng libro tapos siguro ano lang uh, secondary na lang yung kung a, a, a Christian anthropology parang ganoon lang uh, para hindi naman maging kasi pag kasi na yung dark Christian anthropology eh, baka mamaya marami sa eh, hindi naman yan yung talagang Christian anthropology or meron ng kagaya ng sinasabi mo hmm. na pinag-usapan niyan eh uh, pero kung meron ako magiging title na yun nga yung parang yun ang main title ko yun ang magiging unique dun sa ano at sa baba na lang A Christian anthropology. Sabihin, this could be one of the many Christian anthropologies, but at least I'm doing a Christian anthropology here. Parang ganun. Yun ang magiging ano ko siguro. Anyway. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pag, pag natapos ko ito, ipapakritik ko naman ito sa ibig. Kung ano yung masasabi pa nila. Salamat, ano, Franz. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Franz. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Blaze Fingor. Please go ahead. Good evening po. Uh, good evening po, Doc. Thank you po for the presentation. Uh, I, I, I actually, in my impression po, I find the work interesting since it is faithful to the a personalist movement, which tries, of course, to uh, recover transcendence. I just want to ask if there is a plan in the work uh, to concretely respond through the thoughts of the philosophers presented Uh, to some present issues against Christian social teaching, uh, such as divorce, same-sex marriage, and abortion, to name a few. So uh, I just find it in- interesting. Po. Uh, maybe we could use the philosophy of these Christian philosophers to at least respond to issues in our society. Po. I just don't know if you have some thoughts on that, doc, or at least to include in in the in the Uh, sa original na plano wala no so original purpose ko dito just to lay down no fundamentals ng Christian and uh, actually chapter maglagay ng mga parang critical questions or points for discussion Then siguro doon ko na lang ilalagay yung ano ilalagay yung ganung mga issue no uh, alibaba, how how do we appreciate or how do we you know uh, uh, understand or deal or what yung, ito mga issues ito based dito sa mga uh, principles nito uh, and then bahala na yung ano bahala na yung magbabasa kung paano niya titingnan susuriin yung mga issues niyon base doon sa 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 mga principles na yon no uh, hahaba siguro tsaka ay, ayoko maging ano may baka maging polemical yung ano eh yung dating ng yung dating dating ng libro eh uh, naiisip ko rin yun kaya lang sabi ko bahala na yung magbabasa kung paano niya i-apply ito doon sa kanyang sa kanyang pag pagtaya sa kanyang pag analisa doon sa mga current na issues Uh, actually, nabangit ko din sa introduction na sabi ko, uh, pwede rin sagutin mo yung, sagutin yung mga issues, di ba? Nabangit ko yun eh, doon sa introduction, pwede mong sagutin niya isa-isa yung mga issues. Kaya lang, uh, 
uh, sa akin mas maganda siguro kung you lay down uli yung ano lay down uli yung mga mga uh, yung tradition yung mga teachings na yun and then bahala na yung magbabasa kung paano niya parang yung ginawa ko noon sa ethics ko sa libro hindi eh, ako nag ano nag deal doon sa mga specific na mga ethical issues eh basta nilatag ko lang kung uh, ano yung sinasabi ng ethics nito na uh, nasa sa Christian kasi ethics yun maraming ano yun uh, anong sinasabi ng Buddhism anong sinasabi ng ng ni Kant anong sinasabi halimbawa ni Scheller anong sinasabi ni mga ganun tapos bala ka nang mag ano mag apply ng ano yan doon sa mga sa mga issues na yan thank you po doc okay thank you Blaze Thank you, Blaze. And uh, one more question from Mr. Alvin Tan. Go ahead, Sir Alvin. Hello, sir. Yes. Hi. Magandang gabi po. Uh, congrats po. Congrats po. Hindi ko lang tinagkita. Kamusta po? Hindi na po siya talaga parang tanong, pero para siyang clarification lang po. Kasi po, parang siyempre, nag-skip lang po tayo doon sa mga... Uh, chapters, pero I get more or less the, the idea. Pero yung first uh, clarification lang naman po, uh, what seems to be the primary reason or are there some forces uh, why the traditional Christian notion of the human person is currently being challenged or distorted? Kasi in the situation, parang nabanggit yun, pero parang parang hindi, hindi ko nakita sa banda dulo ko. Kasi gura, wala pa akong kopya ng libro nyo. <laughs> so parang ano po yung primary reason bakit hinahamon ngayon ng panahon natin yung traditional Christian notion ng tao. Yun po yung unang clarification. Pangalawa po, um, in relation of it, in what way can these four philosophers na nabanggit na quote yun lang na very common. Una, uh, yung yung binabanggit kong challenge sa uh, doon sa Christian perspective, not necessarily, well, pwede mong sabihin meron ding sa philosophy yung ganyan, pero it's more on the uh, yung binabanggit kong attitudes, yung secularism, yung individualism, yung materialism, yung punteria, no? Yung sinasabi ko challenge Christian tradition but yung tao mismo ano yung tao mismo uh, si si Carol Boiti was very very clear doon ano na yung ina-undermine yung tao mismo although sinasabi niya rin na under na undermine din yung ating uh, tradition yung Christian belief about uh, like for example we say man is a being created in image and likeness of God no bago day at man merong freedom na yung tao ay merong dignity. So sino yung nas, nasaan saan ang gagaling yung mga challenges dito? Well, doon sa mga yun nga, yung binabanggit ko dati yung mga reductionist na perspectives nito. Meron din kasi silang philosophical na kailangan mo edo. Nag-dwell doon ay yun nga, ang ang direction ng ano ko, direction ng nung libro ko is to emphasize kung ano yung tao from a christian based on based on this christian philosophers no yung binabanggit kong yung apat no base sa kanila so ang ano is kagaya nung una kagaya nung sinulat kong textbook sa human person uh, towards an understanding appreciation of the human person it's not really an appreciation of the ideas about the human person Although I discussed the notions, the ideas about the human person, it, it's more on when you read the book, you will appreciate more the person. No, so it's not just to understand what a person is, but to appreciate more the person. Yun din sa libro ito. Yun din yung underlying. Yun din yung ano ko. Yun din yung underlying. Sabi nating motivation ko. Kung dun sa unang libro ko is human person from a from many philosophers diba? kasi doon sa ano this... tradition 
no so the the, the challenge is not really uh, about philosophies sabi ko di ba maraming uh, contending anthropologists diyan but the the main point really is uh, siguro yung palaging na is to 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 highlight yung dignidad ng tao uh, but this time ng Christian tradition na Christian anthropology no anthropology based on the Christian tradition now uh, doon naman sa uh, apat na pinili ko pwede pwede mo naman una uh, basis sa tradition sa Christian tradition talagang malaki ang ambag nitong sila Augustine at saka si no so talagang hindi mo sila mai-ignore tradition. Yung aqua yung Thomistic tradition na sabihin natin of course yung Thomistic tradition embodies yung Christian tradition. So isang reason yun kaya ko sila kaya ko sila pinili ano inaral. At the same time, sila kasi yung talaga kabisado kong mga philosophers. Now pwede ko namang aralin siguro yung ibang mga philosophers na Christian. Uh, may meron kang ano eh, may bias kay doon sa inaaral mo. Uh, siguro naman justified yung pagpili pagpili sa kanila sa na pwedeng makaambag doon sa pagrehabilitate nga nung Christian anthropology. So thank you Atin. Salamat po, Mahusay. Salamat po. Thank you Alvin. We thank you Sir Alvin. Uh, now we have a question from Dr. Carino, Sir Jovi. Joby? Sir Job, teka lang. Uh, okay. Pinapakiusapan ko itong laptop ko. <laughs> ano, umabot yung camera. Anyway, uh, marami na nagtanong about the manuscript. Uh, yung sa akin is siguro partially related to that. Ano lang sir to, parang quick comment lang on your part. Kasi right now, ah, uh, Earlier, rather pala, earlier, you mentioned uh, your reference to John Paul II's uh, Theology of the Body. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ngayon, kung titingnan natin yung uh, current philosophic literature, uh, ang daming philosophers na pinag-uusapan talaga yung pandemya at ang balance points na ginagamit talaga ng yung body. Uh, gusto ko itanong sir kung uh, what are your quick thoughts ba about uh, yung 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 pagiging tao ngayon uh, given our condition right now na sa gitna tayo ng pandemya and using the vantage point of John Paul II's theology of the body. Ano ba ang take mo kung titingnan mo ngayon yung pagiging tao no? uh, using those two uh, as context, yung theology of the body ni Poitiwa at saka yung current human condition ngayon? Okay. Uh, thank you, Jody. Uh, meron akong, akong sinulat na isang... Uh, um, artikulo pero short it's just a short article na ni sinamit ko doon sa ano sa yung World uh, World Congress of Philosophy sa Beijing about body no? uh, ang isa sa premise ko doon ay premises ko doon ay kung no panahon especially during the medieval ang tingin nila negative eh sa yung cost ng kasalanan sa yung alam mo yun, hindi maganda yung tingin sa body kaya kailangan mong paluin yung body kaya kailangan mong pahirapan yung body magfast ka magabstain ka uh, kasi ang tinitinan nila importante yung kaluluwa no importante yung espiritu 
Uh, hayaan mo nang mag-suffer yung body, wag lang mag-suffer yung ano yung ating spirit. Importante. Pero uh, sa theology of the body ni Boitiwa and hindi lang sa theology of the body ni Boitiwa, I think kahit dun sa kanyang acting person, binigyan niya ng emphasis yung soma. No? Yung body. Uh, hindi lang yung physical na I mean, yung of course, importante yung physical, di ba? Pero yung somatic, yung bodily I mean, yung bodily function, uh, yung somatic function, and so on and so forth. So, dito na-highlight yung significance ng body. No? Hindi lang yung spirit. So, sa tingin ko, si Boitiwa ay eh, may balancing pagtingin. Hindi lang dun sa ating uh, spiritual na aspeto ng ating pagkatao. At the same time, yung physical. No? Uh, in fact, uh, nire-recognize niya yung mga yung dynamisms, no? tinatawag niyang dy- somatic dynamisms. Uh, dinagdag ko na rin sa papel na yun yung, of course, yung concept ng body ni, ano, concept ng body ni Marcel. No? Na siya yung medium ng, alam mo, medium ng ating pakiki, pakiki relasyon sa mundo, sa ibang tao, and so on. So, so uh, Based on the theology of the body, we see that we have to give importance to the to the body. Although, uh, nag-focus si Boitiwa dun sa dalawang bagay, ano, sa theology of the body, yung, uh, it's not really ab- just about the body as a physical, no? pero yung dynamism ng body, uh, about, especially about marriage. No? The end, hindi lang naman marriage and inaano niya sa theology of the body, meron din yung about about the vocation, priestly vocation. But anyway, uh, my, my point is, uh, now, body. Okay. Emic, no? Mas lalong na-highlight na kailangan mo talaga pangalagaan yung katawan mo. You know? Uh, Yes, nagdadasal tayo kasi kailangan natin ng deliverance from this pandemic. But at the same time, kailangan natin pangalaga. No, I think uh, more than anything, ang, ang sinasabi ng virus natin ay uh, hindi lang yung espiritu ang vulnerable sa'yo. Pati yung, ka, pati yung katawan mo, vulnerable din. Kailangan mo rin pangalagaan yung iyong katawan. Kailangan mo rin bigyan ng bigyan ng ng atensyon yung katawan mo kasi kapag ka, halimbawa gaya ng nangyayari ngayon na yung yung katawan natin mahina nagkakasakit tayo yung ibang aspeto ng ating pagkatao hindi walang mangyayari hindi ka makaka-relate sa ibang tao ma-isolate ka so yung yung social yung sociality ng tao apektado kasi ano eh uh, nagsasuffer yung body mo so suffer yung yung social aspect Diba? Uh, sabi natin uh, masyadong stress pag sinabi mo pa oh, dahil sa uh, may sakit tayo o may virus hindi tayo makapunta ng simbahan so yung, yung ibang aspeto ng ating pagiging tao apektado dahil apektado yung katawan natin so yun ang thought ko na eh, importante yung katawan pangalagaan mo yung katawan mo no hindi lang hindi lang, of course, kailangan natin magdasal. Kailangan natin ng ganito. Pero ang sinasabi ng, dito sa nakikita ko, kailangan mong balansehin. Hindi ko alam kung, I think it was a question who said that take care of your body as if you will live forever or you will live long and take care of your soul as if you're going to die today. Uh, matagal yun, kisa't Agustin yun. Pero nandun yung wisdom, di ba? Take care of the body as if you're going to live long or you're going to live for an for <laughs> magiging immortal ka. But at the same time, take care of your soul in, as if you're going to die tomorrow or today. So point nun is you have to balance yung yung pag-alaga mo sa sa katawan at sa kaluluwa mo kasi yun nga, babalikan natin yung sinasabi na man is a body and soul. Uh, medieval yan. Or sabi nga natin, ancient yan. Pero ngayon, nagkakaroon ng panibagong ano eh. Dahil sa pandemic nito, nagkakaroon ng panibagong, alam mo yun, uh, kailangan natin ng, tingnan ito sa ng, ng bagong mata. No? Ng bagong perspective. 
Uh, yun lang yung ano, take ko doon, ano, Dr. Jovi. Salamat, sir. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, uh, Dr. Corinio, and thank you, Dr. Aguas. I think uh, we no longer have any questions from the audience. If you have additional ones, uh, you can use the chat box so that uh, Dr. Jov uh, Aguas will be able to read all the other questions. Thank you, Dr. Aguas. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we can proceed with our second presenter. Uh, 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 Aldrin, uh, I saw uh, uh, Dr. Demandante's hand earlier. Baka may, may tatanong siya. Ayaw po. Sorry po, nakimutan ko po. Uh, Dr. Darlene, I apologize. I think you raised your hand earlier. No, it's okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Mamaya ko nabubuksan yung camera ko para makapag-concentrate ako sa comment. Nakaka-anxious kasi. Um, so, first, ano po. Uh, siguro this is more like a comment and an appeal to Dr. Aguas. Um, so when I was listening to the to the presentation at the back of my head, I ha I shared the same question with Blaze. Parang I was thinking, will there be a part in the book wherein you will engage in contemporary debates? Because I think these are really relevant. And then, parang if um if there will be a part of the book which specifically talks about this, for example, issues on sexuality, anti-natalism, climate justice, and the other of uh, divorce, for example, which was mentioned earlier. Parang it would it would be really interesting. And then I heard your answer. You said parang magigig parang ayon yung pung pumunta sa parang sa polemical or ayon yung pung um ayon yung pung pumunta sa debate. And then I was also thinking na parang sayang eh kasi parang at its current form um at its current form I think parang the the reader would be limited to people who also read philosophy. And parang what if someone who isn't into philosophy would like you know pick up this book and then try to find what use they have for the book and then they find these amazing theories and presentation and um interpretations of the theories of the philosophers and then at the end pag sinara nila yung book meron pa ring malaking question mark so parang ang appeal ko lang don't you want to bridge that gap doc aguas kasi parang there are people who need guidance or who might need your you know your um your personal stand or your your idea about what you think about these things and i think parang that would open your book to more audience and would make them appreciate the book parang um last point na lang po parang i've always appreciated the way you taught us philosophy from the beginning this is how you do it you present to us the theories and then you leave us parang to think for ourselves what are we going to do with the theories um ganun po yung pagturo ninyo sa amin and i appreciate from that kind of parang um, pedagogy, and I learned a lot from that practice. But also at the same time, parang we cannot help but um, what you what you call this. Um, we cannot help but also acknowledge that there are really people who need you know specific answers and guidance, even if parang you would go to polemics. Parang po, appeal lang po, Doc. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Darlene. Uh, bang namangit mga ano? Uh, sa klase laging ganoon eh theory tapos bahala kayo mag-isip uh, minsan nagbibigay din ako ng opinion ko kaya lang ko minsan ang kaya ako hindi masyado nagbibigay ng laging yung position ko sa klase kasi una uh, pag pagka teacher ka pagka prof ka parang sa mga estudyante meron ka kagad ano mo yun yung 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 influence ba na pagka ah yun ang sinabi ni sir kaya siguro yun yun ang tama <laughs> di ba parang ganoon pero uh, appreciate yung suggestion mo o yung parang <laughs> yung challenge mo sa akin na magbigay ako ng sarili kong ano eh um, more <laughs> siguro gagawin ko yan pero tapusin ko muna ito itong ma, ma, ano ko muna siya makumpleto ko siya Tapos siguro pag na, ano ko na sa kana ko pupunta doon sa mga issues na yon. But uh, I will I will really consider that. Sana may time pa ako. <laughs> Thank you po. <laughs> na mga ano na magagawayan. Uh, siguro nga kailangan kong pumunta doon. Salamat Darlin. Thank you Dr. Darlin Demandante. Uh, I think we can now proceed uh, after the Response of Dr. Aguas to Dr. Lin. We can now proceed to Dr. Paolo Bulanes for his paper presentation, and it will be entitled "Education as an Ethics of Thinking." Go ahead, Dr. Pao. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, 
uh, Aldrin, I'd like to thank first Dr. Aguas for his uh, engaging uh, sharing and also to those who uh, uh, contributed to the conversation. Um, I think, uh, uh, ano na lang, uh, sa sekundahan ko na lang yung challenge ni uh, Darlene, Dr. Aguas. But maybe it's about time that uh, we philosophers should uh, parang speak more about our opinions, no? Um, especially if uh, 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 the things that we sh that we can share ha have um, you know impact on uh, significant human experiences. Um, well, specifically social and political. Uh, and I think uh, I think uh, don't din nagagaling yung uh, question or concern ni uh, Doc Jovi ni Doc Jovi kanina, no? Um, uh, based on your your reading of Poitiwa, uh, how can how can that reading uh, make sense of the current state of uh, human affairs? So uh, sa tingin ko nandiyan yan. Sa tingin ko kung, kung hindi man sa librong yan, uh, baka may part 2 pa yung trabaho ninyo. Uh, uh, uh na namin. Okay, uh, so I'm going I'm uh, I'm also going to share something with you. Uh tingnan ko kung kagana. Um lang. Kaya nakikita ba? Yes po, Doc. Ano yung nakikita? Kasi itong ayaw ko sa Zoom eh. Biglang pagka shishinare mo, biglang sasabog yung screen mo. Uh, title page po. Title page. So, ayan ang nakikita nyo. Apo. Diba? Okay. Okay, I'll just... Uh... Title page with my email on it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um... Yeah, maski, na, maski sa mga work in progress natin, nandiyan pa rin yung marka ng EdTech. Ano? Teka, bakit yung email ko nakalagay sa akin? Uh, it's uh, a technical thing. It's uh, something that... Uh, Sorry, give proper yan, sir. Uh, puro JS Agwas at USD.PH. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nakaka-distract din eh. Nakaka-distract. Anyway... I think uh, we'll have to coordinate with EdTech no para i-off nila yung yung ano yan yung uh, naka naka preset eh. Uh, all right. Um so good afternoon good evening everybody uh, to the first uh, uh, work in progress seminar of the academic year. Um uh, hopefully this uh, you know uh, this uh, first session will uh, you know um inspire us no uh, to attend attend the other work works in progress um, now uh, uh, so that we could save time and we'll have more time for discussion I'll go straight uh, to my um, sharing but first before I read what I'm supposed to read I'd like to uh, mention that uh, the um, uh, the it's it's not well, it, it was a paper, but now it's part of the book I'm the, the book I just finished writing. Um, uh, and the Katulad uh, Dr. Aguas, the the uh, section or the section of the uh, the the one that I'm reading today, the uh, um, the paper or the the chapter, or um, as a matter of fact, the afterword of the book. So afterward is part, of course, of the book that I just finished. No, uh, the the title of the book is Ethics, Justice, and Recognition: Essays on Critical Theory. Currently, it's being reviewed uh, by the USD Publishing House. So, uh, tapayana natin ko ano yung kanilang decision. Um, but I'd also like to share uh, the the table of content. No? Para makita lang ninyo, just to give you a preview of uh, what you can expect um, uh, when the book uh, uh, it's already out. Uh, sana na, sana ma, ma, ano, maayos ng uh, UST Publishing House. Uh, or at least tanggapin nila. Uh, so uh, uh, the book has uh, eight chapters with an additional 
uh, afterward. And it's the afterword that I'm going to read today, which is entitled Education as an Ethics of Thinking. Uh, so just to give you the background no, uh, of, the, of the volume that I just finished, which is, by the way, the product of my sabbatical uh, last academic year. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, a few portions of the introduction just to give you uh, parang, um, a working idea what the book is all about. Uh, so in this volume, I have brought together a collection of essays that I have written over the course of a decade and a half on the subject of critical theory. Roughly put, critical theory is the critical observation and prognosis of the pathological tendencies of societal structures and cultural practices by bringing together interpretative resources from philosophy, humanities, and the various social sciences. Critical theory as an intellectual movement originated in Germany in the early 1930s and whose first proponents were members of the Institute für Sozialforschung at the University of Frankfurt. They were referred to as the Frankfurt School, a group of intellectuals headed by the successor of Karl Gutberg, Max Horkheimer, who laid down the critical theory program in his 1931 inaugural address, the present situation of social philosophy and the task of an institute for social research. In his inaugural address, Horkheimer instituted a program that combines both theoretical and empirical approaches to the analysis of German society at the time. And while his program did not totally break away from the empirical, empirical historical approach of Grunberg, Horkheimer radically shifted his emphasis from the research on the history of labor movements to the normative relationship between scientific inquiry and society and the material and spiritual lived experiences of human beings in a capitalist society. Okay, so there's a discussion there of the origin of the idea of critical theory from uh, Karl Marx. Uh, just, a, just a historical note, uh, you, if you're looking for a, de a definition of critical theory, you'll, you'll find it in um, the letter that Karl Marx wrote to Arnold Ruge. So, but I'll skip that. Um, Antabayanan yun na lang yung discussion na lang na yan. Now, in this, in, uh, in this present volume, in the book, uh, I intend to explore some of the main philosophical preoccupations of the Frankfurt School, such as ethics, justice, and recognition. The ensuing chapters then are prefigured by these themes. And my aim is not only to present these essays in systematic form, but also to introduce critical theory to, a wide, to the wider Filipino audience by highlighting its theoretical and practical aspects. In a certain sense, as I point out in the first chapter, this, pro uh, this project is my own way of addressing the deficit in philosophical praxis that has characterized academic philosophy in the Philippines. In my book, uh, the, the recent one, the Brown book, Nietzsche and Adorno on Philosophical Praxis, Language and Reconciliation, I relate philosophical praxis to the ethics of thinking, which, philo which is philosophy's self-reflection or, or self-understanding, a process which is inaugurated by philosophy's sensitivity to its own language. Moreover, praxis can also be understood as a process of linguistic reconfiguration based on what is inherited from the philosophical tradition uh, and the historical um, exigencies that surround the tradition. Furthermore, philosophical praxis has something to do with philosophy's engagement with material, material reality, that is to say with, with socio-political reality. So the, def the deficit in philosophical praxis could also be described as a crisis of appropriation, which is characterized, I argue, by our reliance on the language of scholastic metaphysics and our proverbial hesitation to properly read and hence appropriate uh, uh, materialist philosophy, such as of the Frankfurt School. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, ito siguro magandang basahin. While there are already a number of Filipino scholars who have written on some critical theorists like Eric Fromm and Jürgen Habermas, the manner of appropriation is still, to my mind, quite problematic. And I will only mention here what I think are the two dominant problematic readings. For instance, in the book Alternative to a Dead God, uh, written by uh, Dr. Florentino Timbreza, 
He presents an existential theological reading of Fromm, offering Fromm as the solution to the lacuna left by the death of God. Meanwhile, in Emerita Quito, uh, in her book uh, on hermeneutics, uh, where he presents Habermas as a systematic hermeneutic philosopher, akin to Willem Diltai and G uh, Hans Georg Gadamer, my problem, uh, my problem with these uh, appropriations is that they are deflated, albeit unintentionally. Prese uh, presentations of Fromm and Habermas neglecting the most important aspect of their respective works, that is the materialist critique of society. And by simply reading Fromm as an existentialist theologian or Habermas as a hermeneutic intersubjectivist, we overlook the radical radicality of their ideas more specifically what they can offer as fecund theoretical practical frameworks for social political critique. All right, so uh, that's just a very quick preview of what you can expect from the book. Now, uh, just a little description of what I'm going to read. I turn to the last part of, the, of my introduction. Um, the afterwards, I, I gave a description of the afterword here. Uh, in the afterward, I share my thoughts on the current state of education, which I present uh, following Adorno as reified education. I rehearse Adorno's ideas of pseudo-culture, maturity, and ethical education so that I may be able to uh, adumbrate from them the relationship between education and the ethics of thinking. I begin by describing what I deem as some manifestations of contemporary education. I maintain that against the backdrop of the fourth industrial revolution, the rise of post-truth culture within new populist regimes and the predominance of the ideology of quality assurance in educational institutions demonstrate the reification of, cultural, of culture and education. Moreover, by revisiting Adorno's descriptions of the author, authoritarian personality and the proliferation of instrumental reason, we begin to understand why anti-democratic tendencies are prevalent and that the sway of instrumental reason is leading us towards our self-destruction. Adorno reminds us about the true goal of education, which we could ramify from the ideas of pseudo-culture, maturity, and ethical education. Education is a process of self and cultural cultivation, what the Germans call Bildung, that dialectically leads individuals to a kind of democratic maturation, the capacity to participate in the political life of society. I emphasize at the end that uh, educational maturity is the capacity to think ethically, which in practical terms follows the democratic principle of the defiance of authoritarian rule. So, siguro you'll see already the under, yung, yung, yung nabanggit ni Dr. Aguas na yung uh, uh, polemical no undertone. So um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised then if you find my my sharing as polemical. Uh, so education as an ethics of thinking. Again, this is the last part of the book, no, the afterword. The main premise uh, of this short essay is that our, our that is that ours is the age of reified education or reified culture. This, ironic, this is ironic because the present age is proverbially described as the age of information. That is to say of unfiltered access to information, whether authentic or fake via the internet. This is the main feature according to contemporary pundits of the fourth industrial revolution or the digital revolution, which is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. This setup is supposed to democratize the delivery of education. However, the fact that people today have ready and quick access to information through simple clicks on their smart smartphones does not corroborate the, the assumption that people are more informed. It seems like the opposite is the case. As part of the commodification of learning, much of information today are consumed through social media and entertainment platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Netflix. The fourth industrial revolution has actualized this unprecedented hyper-production of information, which has rendered opaque the distinction between fact and fiction. 
It is not difficult to agree with pundits who maintain that we live in the era of post-truth, wherein honesty and accuracy are no longer assigned the highest priority in political exchange. People have already lost faith in traditional media and are now under the spell of fake news and conspiracy theories. As such, the political consciousness of people is now profoundly shaped by alternative facts and opinions that appeal more to emotions and biases as opposed to critical thinking. The rise to power of cultural populists like Donald Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and of course our very own uh, Rodrigo Duterte, and the phenomenon of Brexit uh, uh, demonstrate how powerful post-truth politics can be. The culture of post-truth is not only an assault on science, as we have seen in how cultural populists have downplayed the effects of COVID-19, but it is an assault on the ethics of thinking. A, a culture is now shaped by the hyperproduction of fake news and trash entertainment. The reification of culture also manifests as the reification of education. A dimension of, a dimension of, the, of the reification of education is the predominance of the ideology of standardization an ideology camouflaged with ideas such as quality, outcomes, global citizenship, or scientific impact. State policies such as the ones issued by the Philippine Commission on Higher Education through standardizing assessments such as university rankings, program accreditations, outcome-based education, journal impact factor, and bibliometrics. Quality assurance has become this generalized logic of accountability, masquerading as a, a, as a commitment to excellence declared in every school's vision and mission statement. The bad faith of, ideal, of the ideology of quality assurance is that, in the first place, the use of the term quality is rather misleading. This is also because the, the system of audit that quality assurance employs can only measure what is essentially external to, to real learning. For instance, school managers can only impose a surveillance mechanism to count, uh, many, uh, how, to count how many hours a certain professor is able to meet her students, but they will never be able to measure how deeply her students were able to learn from her teaching. As Stefan Collini puts it, I quote, society demands accountability, but from the more mechanical expression of this demand, all it gets is the external show of accountability, end of quote. Therefore, it is not quality that is measured, but rather quantity. The name then should be deliberately changed from quality assurance to quantity assurance. At least with this new name, we know exactly what we are being asked to do. This is the elephant in the room that most of us and in our institutions do not acknowledge or that we simply and unwittingly choose to ignore. This logic of accountability is is to be motivated profoundly by the dictates of the market economy more than normativities of education as building, that is to say of self-cultivation and cultural maturation. The topic of education as building is one of the highlights of the, of the, of the work of the German critical theorist Fyodor Adorno. One commentator even, acclaim, even claims that Quote, Adorno's reflections on education are the most fruit fruitful part of his work as they articulate positive, concrete, and conceptually founded visions of what a right pedagogical action might be and how educational institutions should be reformed, end of quote. If this is the case, then it is possible to reflect on reified education via the mode of critique that Adorno offers. In the following, I will engage with reified education by exposing some of the key themes in Adorno's critique of education. The, the three main sources of this critique of education are the short piece, uh, Theory of Pseudoculture, Theory der Habildung, the posthumously published uh, interview with Helmut Becker, and Sihung Zürmendikait, uh, Education for Maturity, uh, and the essay, Education After Auschwitz. Based on this, uh, there are three themes in Adorno's critique of education that we need to pay attention to, namely pseudo-culture, maturity, and ethical education. However, before looking further into the three uh, 
themes uh, I mentioned, it would be worthwhile to look back into two earlier works in order to set the point of departure. I'm referring to the authoritarian personality and the dialectic of enlightenment. Both books are concerned about the nature of authoritarianism. The former is an empirical study of the sources of authoritarian behavior against a backdrop of authoritarian education, while the latter presents enlightenment as an inflection of the barbaric tendency of reason that results in authoritarianism. In the authoritarian personality, Adorno and uh, other authors as well introduce the F scale. F stands for fascists, which, may, which, which was meant to measure potentially anti-democratic personality. Through the F scale, they were able to identify at least nine personality traits that are dominantly present in so-called individuals who were brought up through authoritarian education, such as conventionalism, authoritarian submission, authoritarian aggression, anti-interception, uh, su uh, superstition and stereo stereotypy, or stereotypy, power and toughness, destruct destructiveness and cynicism, projectivity and exaggerated concern with sex. I, I don't know why uh, that, that the last one was included. Uh, uh, these personality traits are expressed on the surface in ethnocentrism as well as psychologically related opinions and attitudes. But for Adorno uh, uh, and, and his co-authors taken together, these personality traits form a single syndrome a more or less enduring structure in the person that renders him, re renders him receptive to anti-democratic propaganda. Adorno's findings in, in the authoritarian personality provide us with some insight into how and why anti-democratic the anti-democratic attitude was widespread. What is, re what is revealed is that authoritarianism is systematic or systemic and endemic. Moreover, it is a system that is sustained by predominant personality traits within a given group of people who readily and unwittingly submit to authoritarian rule. While the context of Adorno's study is the National Socialist regime in Germany this, uh, during the Second World War, the study itself was conducted while he was in exile in the United States, where he, together with Max Horkheimer and Marcuse, discovered the fascist tendency of the ultra consumerist mentality of American culture. I quote, the historical phenomenon of fascism no longer appears as in the orthodox Marxist view as the last political stage of monopoly capitalism, but is related in manifold ways to overarching structures of bourgeois thought and action, end of quote. Meanwhile, in the dialectic of enlightenment, Adorno and Horkheimer describe uh, the barbaric tendency of the enlightenment as a proliferation of instrumental reason. The dialectic of enlightenment provides the normative resources for a, so for a social theory against which the scientific, scientific, moral, cultural, and psychological phenomena of the self-destruction of enlightenment may be interpreted. Adorno and Orkheimer write, I quote, for enlightenment, anything which does not conform to the standard of calculability and utility must be viewed with suspicion. Once the movement is able to develop um, unhampered by external oppression, there is no holding back. Its own ideas of human rights then fare no better than older universals. Any intellectual res resistance it encounters merely increases its strength. The reason is that enlightenment also recognizes itself in the old myths. No matter which myths are invoked against it, by being used as, as arguments, they may are, they are made to acknowledge the very principle of corrosive rationality of which enlightenment stands accused. Enlightenment is totalitarian, end of quote. Adorno and Orkheimer, therefore, uh, paint a picture of enlightenment whose pathological turn is destined towards self-destruction. Enlightenment is a, is a distillation from a kind of rationality that dominates nature through the assistance of science and technology, affirms the status quo, and propagates an administered way of life fueled, the, fueled by the market economy and political ambition. Indeed, the progress which the Enlightenment promises is Janus face, uh, as it assures as of a kind of freedom whose main goal is to oppress. 
the premises presented in the authoritarian personality and the dialectic of enlightenment provide basic normative assumptions from which we could begin to understand what Adorno means by pseudo-culture, maturity, and ethical education. In, theor in the uh, theory, there are Habildung, he speaks of Habildung, or literally half education, hab, no? hab and bildung, half education or half culture, but maybe properly understood as pseudo culture. In this essay, Adorno is worried that education as bildung uh, is now reduced to pseudo culture, that cultural formation is reduced to pseudo culture. For Adorno, education is a dialectical struggle of someone who navigates between individual autonomy and social adaptation. As such, cultural formation or bildung presupposes this dialectical struggle where it enables an individual to confront the conflict between autonomy and social submission. The absence of this conflict, therefore, results in a kind of half education because the development of personal identity and social integration is arrested. Culture, Adorno writes, and I quote, has become socialized pseudo-culture uh, the omnipresence of alienated spirit, end of quote. Pseudo-culture or the disconnection from the dialectical, from dialectical cultural formation is what characterizes a kind of educational system that ideologically focuses only on certain purposes, especially narrow economic purposes. If only the interests of the dominant groups determine the aims of education, then what follows is pseudo-culture. To quote Adorno again, in the concept of pseudo-culture, the, commodif the commodified, reified content of culture survives at the expense of its truth its content and its vital relation to living subjects. This roughly accords with its definition, the fact that today the term pseudo-culture has acquired the same antiquated and arrogant reputation of folk culture does not prove that the phenomenon has disappeared, but, th but rather that its counter-concept culture itself, which alone makes it comprehensible, is no longer present. For better or worse, only isolated individuals who have not been absorbed completely in the melting pot or professional groups who celebrate themselves as elites still participate in culture. However, the culture industry in the widest sense, everything jar jargon cer certifies as mass media, per perpetuates the state of affairs by exploring it. End of quote. In relation to the dialectical development of culture uh, in Erziung, Erzihung uh, Tsur uh, Mundikait, Adorno echoes a Kantian position on the relationship between education uh, and democracy. And he says democracy is founded on the education of each individual in political, social, and moral awareness as embodied in the institution of the representative vote. If this process is not to result in irrationality, then a prerequisite must be the capacity and courage of each individual to make full use of his reasoning power. And of course, by highlighting this Kantian premise, Adorno emphasizes the political character of mature education. In this context, the participation of an individual in democratic practices does not only uh, does not only to her personal uh, and political maturation. Uh, but it signals uh, the individual's political, social, and moral maturity. What we can take from this is that for Adorno, one's educational maturity lies in her capacity to engage herself in the concreteness of social political reality. Another way of saying this is that if one is truly educated, then as then one has the moral duty to live a political life, meaning one should not in should not disengage from a critical as opposed to a conformist outlook on life. In this sense, being educated then is, is this capacity to be critical, that is to say to resoluteness, um, uh, that's to say the resoluteness to say that something is morally wrong. Meanwhile, in education after Auschwitz, um, Adorno emphatically declares, I quote, the, the premier demand upon all education is that Auschwitz not happen again, end of quote. As a powerful image of thought, Adorno used the historical memory of Auschwitz in order to express education's moral content. 
Auschwitz is, of course, used here to emphatically illustrate the reality of human suffering caused by humans. In this context, the moral content, content of education today is a recognition of the reality of human suffering and its alleviation. According to Adorno, human suffering exists because, as we, because we allow it to happen due to our blind submission to an immoral system. Quite ironically, as in the case of Adolf Eichmann, uh, who orchestrated the, the extermination of Jews during the Holocaust, moral, upright, and educated people allow evil to happen because they gravely misconstrue the meaning of duty. In her report on Eichmann's trial in Jerusalem, Hannah Arendt observes that Eichmann earnestly, earnestly believed um, that he had lived his whole life according to Kant's moral precepts, and, and especially according to a Kantian definition of duty. However, Arendt contends that Eichmann had confused blind obedience with moral duty and, and espoused a rather distorted version of the categorical imperative, that is to act as if the principle of your actions were the same as that of the legislator or of the, or of the law of the land, the categorical, the categorical imperative of the Third Reich. That's a quotation from Arendt. So by twisting the categorical imperative, uh, a good citizen like Eichmann carries out the law of the land as long as the Führer deems it moral. What Eichmann failed to understand, according to Arendt, is that Kant's categorical, imperatives, uh, categorical imperative presupposes the autonomy of the moral agent and that the will of some external, not, and not the will of some external authority. Adorno may add that not only does this categorical imperative of the Third Reich incapacitate the individual for self-actualization, this type of thinking or non-thinking also incapacitates one to empathize with the other, or with, with the suffering others, uh, or empathize with the suffering of others. Adorno, uh, Adorno speaks about the authority of conscience as opposed to the nefarious authority of the tyrannical figure. Uh, the sing uh, I quote the single genuine power standing against the principle of Auschwitz, Adorno declares, is, uh, is autonomy, or to use a Kantian expression, the power of reflection, of self-determination, of not cooperating, end of quote. In this context, then, the development of the power of reflection and self-determination is a goal of democratic education that Kant envisioned in which Adorno echoes. Uh, moreover, we can only construe democracy here in its, more, in its most radical form as the antithesis to centralize oppressive power. Uh, articulating the three ideas above, um, uh, pseudo-culture, maturity, and ethical education, we begin to understand that the goal of education for, uh, we begin to understand the goal of education for Adorno. First, it is the role of education to raise cultural citizens through Bildung, the process of self and cultural cultivation. Second, for Adorno, self and cultural cult cultivation is a process of maturation that will allow the eventual participation of an individual in the democratic practices of society, that is in the political life of, of a society. Third, the core element of maturity is the capacity to think ethically, which Adorno adumbrates following Kant as the audacity to follow one's conscience and defy tyranny. Adorno, however, made his remarks against the backdrop of rarefied education. It is in this sense that I think his views, of, his views on education can prove themselves relevant today. In our present context, context re, uh, reified education, as I have pointed out at the beginning, manifests in our obsession with standardized, standardized metrics of quality assurance. The, educational, the education system shift to the ideology of quality assurance is the abandonment of education's ultimate telos, which is the nurturement of a kind of ethical thinking that will, that will not allow another Auschwitz to happen. Alas, since we have bowed down to our new authority figures, accreditors, assessors, auditors, and rankers with phantom badges of quality uh, as our new currency, uh, with phantom badges of quality as our new currency, we have forgotten the most fundamental reason why we are, we, 
why we educate young people so that they may think ethically. In the current state of things today, it is incumbent upon us educators not to not shun away from education self-reflexivity so that it may reveal itself for what it, what it currently is, hap bildung. Okay? And we are participating in half culture, in pseudo culture. This self-reflection is essentially a dialectical democratic process of self-understanding and self-critique. Democratic education uh, democratic, it is democratic because education today should become an antithesis to its own reification. So it's a form of self critique. The impetus for teaching the young how to think and act ethically is education's retrieval of its own ethical telos. So uh, I end there. That's the end of the afterword and also the end of the book. Uh, and the end of my share, my presentation. So thank you very much, and uh, hopefully we'll have a uh, a fruitful uh, conversation. Thank you, Doc Pao, for that extensive discussion and substantial discussion as well. Uh, the floor is now open, our dear audience, for questions and insights and clarifications regarding the presentation made by Dr. Bolanos. Uh, we have uh, Sir Ignacio. Yes, good evening. Um, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, JV. Hello, my okay friend. Yung camera mo? Uh, I'm not the... Magulo, magulo ngayon eh, sorry. <laughs> so, medyo wag na muna ngayon. <laughs> Kasi I had chores to do, so uh, kind of messy right now. Anyway, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pao to... For, for that uh, piece. And I also like to emphasize my appreciation of uh, his reiteration of Kant's concept of education, which uh, I think has been uh, a little bit downplayed in the realm of discussion in education philosophy. And uh, the question, and I agree with, with what we have said, that uh, the telos of education indeed is the moralization, uh, as Kant would say, the moralization project of the human of the human race. But the question now uh, that I raise to my friend is, what can we do in this reification dilemma that you have mentioned, when institutions are actually being uh, manipulated by accreditation, by even by government sometimes, uh, what is now the role of us in the academy in this reification uh, dilemma? Thank you, uh, boss. Okay, thank you, uh, JV. Uh, of course, there's no uh, overnight uh, solution to the problem, uh, but uh, it, 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 I think it, it starts with uh, self-criticism uh, and self-reflection. We have to uh, first look at ourselves in the mirror. And I think as a department, we've been doing that. Second is to, uh, 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 to, to say that something is wrong when we think that something is wrong. Uh, so I think it's our ethical obligation as educators, uh, not only to to, to you know to uh, spread information uh, but I think education uh, apart from spreading information uh, education too is the moral political social uh, you know maturity no, of uh, our students a process of the moral social and political maturity of our students um, because at the end of the day what matters will be maski magaling mag, magaling kang doktor magaling kang uh, engineer, uh, nurse, what matters would be your decision at the end of the day. Um, uh, pero, yeah, I, it's a, I, I get your question. It's a challenge. Pero sa tingin ko, um, one of the things we can do is to, um, sabi nga ni Darlene, wag matakot maging polemical. Um, uh, and uh, uh, 
that's precisely what we're we've been doing no uh uh in the in the past few uh conferences that we've had uh you, you the, 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 that that not only the self criticism but uh, but also the critique the critique of this kind of uh educational ideology um is uh, is is reiterated uh so ito uh na, na reiterate ko na naman no but, but this time it's part of my uh part of the book that i just finished um so sa tingin ko uh, in, uh ang, ang uh, gawin natin yung mga kaya natin no to, to use philosophy the, the tools in philosophy kasi what we have as philosophers what we can contribute rather as philosophers is uh, what i i can refer to as a kind of critical vocabulary no a kind of uh, uh, critical vocabulary that uh, um, can be used to uh, you know to criticize make sense of uh, the situation uh, hindi natin masusolve to kaagad-agad eh uh, not with one conference actually nakakailang conference na tayo hindi pa nas- hindi, hindi na solve kasi hindi naman nakikinig yung mga tao nakakailang opinion pieces na tayo sa Rappler at saka sa uh, uh, in- inquirer even our former uh, uh, secretary general is very oh, is very is very vocal regarding his critique of uh, quality assurance yung ganyan pero um hindi uh, hindi uh, atag dito uh, mahi, ma, mahirap yung laban uh, kasi uh, pero sa tingin ko as educators what we can do is to um, actually go back to the fundamentals even in 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 teaching ako I, when i teach i just go back to the fundamentals uh and and uh, i i think my students appreciate that uh when what they feel in my class what they experience in my class is uh hopefully what they're experiencing in my class is philosophy no paano natin ginagawa yung philosophy no uh, hindi namin hindi namin uh, i mean uh uh it's it's not uh, actually was it in yesterday's class my in the class yesterday when we talk about the syllabus i mean the the problem with the with the syllabus no problem with uh people from the education you know discipline uh who call themselves uh student centered but there's nothing student centered in the way they're doing things it, no, no. Their, their style their pedagogical style is actually syllabus centered no? no don't get me uh, started with that <laughs> uh, not student centered so yeah i think it was in yesterday's class when i mentioned that there's nothing student centered about what they're doing mm-hmm. um uh, so uh yun lang masasabi ko actually we, i'm also in uh in in a place where i'm grappling with uh i'm also struggling with the with the idea of uh you know how to the idea of solving the problem kasi ko sa tingin ko hindi na, we'll just have to continue what we have been doing so far you know and eventually kasi i think the uh, the friend of philosophy is time the friend of philosophy is time uh even some for example when nietzsche uh uh uh, tagdito, uh metaphorically hyperbolically declared the death of god through his madman in the gay science that didn't make sense to his contemporaries no and he was uh, accused of being an atheist and so on it took the first and second world wars to prove his point <laughs> right that um uh maybe uh we need a war no uh we need uh to expand our conception of god that's what it means so anyway uh, that's another discussion but uh, we need time i don't think it can happen overnight no it to lang natin tong 
polemic. Tuloy lang natin yung sa tingin nating tamang ginagawa natin. Uh, nakakainis. Magkarap kasi hindi nakikinig yung mga taong dapat makinig. Pero uh, actually, kung makinig naman sila, mawawalan talaga sila ng trabaho. Yeah, that's exactly my uh, my frustration as well, uh, sir. Because it seems that in, in our in our small circle of the department and those of our students and colleagues in the graduate school, it seems that tayo lang yung nagkakaintindihan. And the frustrating part, it's not just because the administration are, are uh, the management is not listening to us, it's because also of the other educators of our own colleagues in the other colleges who are more concerned of just uh, obeying what is the Pakukowa or Paasku or CHED uh, standards without really understanding why on earth they are supposed to do that in the first place. And that for me is the frustrating part. Not because management is not listening to us, because in a way... I, I think, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, in a way... I ko yung sinasabi mo, yung... Uh, yung uh, not, not just compliance eh, yung submission or blind submission no yeah because it's easier to do that it's easier to just blindly submit to uh, an ideology than uh, questioning it kasi siguro akala nila pag question mo wala sila ng uh, hanap buhay o uh, they want to sleep peacefully at night That's why I invoke uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ideas of Adorno on pseudo-culture and maturity because that's, uh, those are the things that are precisely uh, eh, parang, uh, not nurtured in the current educational setup that we have. Exactly. And another sad fact is that the education, the, the, the institutions that are supposed to be the ones who first, who should you know, um, raise this issue are the ones who are actually supporting it, like the education, like yeah. the of education, uh, college of science, you know, just imagine college of science, it's dapat talaga freedom of experimentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What no, wala, you know, everything was funneled. I agree with you. Uh, the college of science, yeah. dapat mas radical pa yan dapat kaysa Supposedly, TV. kaysa sa atin. Oh. Kasi sila yung 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 system talaga nila ang uh, ang yeah, katamaan yeah. their system uh, their system will the, the one that, that will benefit profoundly from freedom of uh, speech and uh, yung tagdon yung uh, uh, what's the term again uh, uh, yung academic freedom yes yes yeah. yes exactly. well Anyway, I don't want to hog the uh, discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Pao. Yeah. Thank you, JV. Thank you. Thank you, Sir JV. And thank you, Dr. Pao. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Franz. Sir Franz, go ahead, Bo. Thank you, Aldrin. Uh, sir, uh, hello. Good evening. Hello, Franz. Uh, ang iniisip ko lang ano, um, what is your ano, what is your take on the limits and potentials of uh, student activism, not only in the macro perspective, macro issues, but rather internal student activism within the institution. They are active on policies, on accreditation, on how syllabus would be uh, formulated. What's your take on this? Hindi talaga merong ano, student activism. I mean, uh, when you say activism, ba, you're just referring to student involvement or yung radical activism? Uh, uh, hindi, yung, ano, yung uh, involvement in ano, more on the policy making. Policy making. Uh, actually, yes. Uh, students are actually or should be involved. And it's part of the policy, not only of the, of the university, but also of CHED. That when we are reviewing in 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 uh, revising our curricula, uh, we should be involving our students uh, and also our alumni and uh, alumni uh, who are working in other industries. 
Um, kaya yung the, the, the students should be involved in that process. Uh, kasi nasa ano na yan eh, nasa, nasa, mo, nasa, uh, nasa CMO yan ng CHED eh, uh, na when we are revising, involved dapat yung mga stakeholders na yan. Uh, um, kaya, and that's why in, in, in our Saturday's cluster meeting, I ask you to invite your uh, former students or and uh, the graduate students are also invited. So that uh, the conversation will not just be one-sided. Uh, it, it involves the voices of uh, those who are going to benefit uh, from from the revisions. Um, kaya yun ang kung ang tanong mo yung involvement lang ng mga sujente sa policy making. Uh, wala ako wala akong problema doon. Uh, dapat involved sila. Dapat pakinggan natin yung kanilang uh, sinasabi. What about the limits and potentials of, ano, of uh, uh, radical uh, student activism? What are, are there also potentials really for, ano, for some changes? Uh, what do you, uh, I don't know if I understand your second question correctly. Yung Uh, yung radical activism kung kung may mga sujanting mga radical activists uh, basically students who uh, go to rallies and ganun uh, makadagdag pa yon ng pagbabago any movement actually regardless of whether uh, uh dito whether the movement is destructive or creative any movement can result in change Uh, so uh, uh, practically that's a, a very fundamental Aristotelian diba? uh, uh, doctrine. Uh, any movement can or any kind of movement can result in change, but what whatever change that is that depends on you know the movements, no? Uh, uh, sana lang eh, yung pagsali nila is informed uh, by research and study. Uh, kasi uh, uh, kung hindi naman nangyari yung ganun, hindi naman, just imagine we were, just imagine there will not be ed, uh, EDSA, the first EDSA, di ba? Di, hindi natin na uh, revive, hindi natin na uh, ano yung Uh, ano natin yung political uh, space, democratic space. Yeah, yung democratic space na yon. Uh, and we have we have, we would have not uh, overcome that stage in our history. Uh, kaya pero may limitations ba yon? Uh, lahat. Oh yeah, uh, may limitations din. Depende kung paano natin titignan. Uh, limitations in the sense na Uh, delikado para sa mga sudyante uh, uh, delikado I mean uh, the university university too is be, being careful about 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 it kasi kung maredtag maredtag yung university eh, yun ang iniiwasan no pero lahat ng mga to hindi natin makokontrol lahat eh di ba So the, the the most that a university can do, for example, if there's a group of students, uh, the least rather, or the yeah, least, parang the tendency rather of uh, of the university, if there there's a group of students who are really active, no, either i babad nila or i i is a silent is a silence na lang nila, no, um, para hindi ma apektuhan yung image ng university. Uh, pero I don't, yes, there are limitations, but I don't know if we can actually uh, control these limitations. Um, kung ang, pag, kailangan ba natin pigilan sila? Di ba? Huwag natin silang uh, palabasin o ano, eh, kung naiiniwala talaga sila doon sa pinaglalaban nila maski anong uh, gawin natin uh, lalabas at lalabas yung mga... pero of course we 
uh, try our best to put things in the right context no uh, so that's so that's why when maski naman magtuturo tayo ng marx okay ako i've i've been teaching marx for so many years but i've always been very clear to my students uh about uh uh you know the uh Uh, the outcome of the course. The outcome is not for them to become Marxists, although that's also something that I cannot, I cannot uh, control. Diba? I mean, dapat natin yun, kasi natin mga control. You don't even need a, a course on Marx, diba? para ano, para para maging activist yung mga ano mo, mga sujante mo. So. Uh, Pero meron atang comments yun ng si Mam Flor connected sa ano. Yeah, sige. Nasa, ano, nasa chat room. Thank you, thank you. Ah, yes, according to Doc Al- Alvella, uh, the unfortunate state of student activism in USD only mind about hair color policy. In my stint as SWDC, never did any group invoke a walkout because of accreditation. The farthest they went was to oppose the use of Respondus Lockdown brow- Browser. That's just a recent movement. Uh, yung pa, yung isang aspeto no, uh Thank you, Floor, for pointing that out. Yung pa yung isang aspeto ng uh, uh, activism. Kasi baka, sabi ko kanina, sa, kung maging activist sila, sana their activism is informed by research and, uh, you know, and, and uh, yung talagang importante yung pinaglalaban. Uh, yung yung hindi activism because uh, it serves only a small group of or yung, yung parang active i don't know uh, yung uh, how, how can i describe I, i can only think of one example yung activism ng mga trump supporters parang ganun no wag sana ng ganun yung, yung yung type of activism nila thank you doc pao and thank you doc Lur, for the comment uh, i think we have another question from dr carino sir jovi go ahead po Uh, thank you, uh, Andrin, and thank you, Sir Pao. Thank you, Jovi. Just waiting for my camera to get activated. Sige lang. Solar powered po kasi itong camera. Uh, <laughs> tsaka umuulan ngayon, walang araw. Pagka madilim ay takes a while. Yan, Nakik- yan. Ba ko? Yes po, Doc. Ayan. Anyway, uh, uh, several things in my mind. Yung, in the initial part of your presentation, sir, yung, when you were talking about nga yung, your views on edu- education, especially uh, on how it is being carried out now or practiced in the university context. Naalala ko lang bigla yung how is it being how was it being done rather during the early days. May, when, may, when I say early days, I mean uh, antiquity down to let's say middle ages na kung tutusin, there's no such thing as education para yung geometry was being taught as geometry, parang gano'n. Music as being taught as music, walang education. Parang uh, the process of uh, passing on music to some to someone else is considered as a musical activity. Yes. But apprenticeship, as, uh, no? Apprenticeship mm, yung nangyayari. Just as when a professor like Thomas Aquinas would teach theology, uh, it's him doing theology in the presence of his students. I mean, walang education. Eh ngayon, parang nangyayari nga yung you're doing philosophy, so you need to fit your philosophy within the second layer called education para, para maging, para makapag-philosophize ka. Yun, just, just, just a thought. Ngayon, yung pong aking question is actually a borrowed question. Uh, I'm coming from the comment of Dr. Cleopas, kung natatandaan niya yung uh, panel discussion dati. Yeah. Hihiramin ko yung tanong niya and use it as my parang take off point. Ano ito eh, parang para pong tanong ng isang devil's advocate. I am representing actually Obra tonight. 
Okay. <laughs> and I'm using this opportunity to air this question. Yung, kung natatanda ko yung intervention or yung discussion ni Ma'am Cleopas, Ma'am Jackie, uh, parang she was saying something like uh, quality assurance has its own uses. And uh, we do not need to totally discard it. We can in fact uh, make it or use it for our own purposes. And uh, we might be surprised uh, it can be a boon to us uh, once we are able to you know, use it properly. My, 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 my first question is your take on that comment. Kasi nung sa panel discussion po, parang we didn't really have a chance uh, to hear your views on each other's views. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you might uh, say a few words about it. Ngayon, yung second question ko po, this is more related to uh, the entirety of your presentation. Yung, ito, ito na ako, ako na yung mole ng obra. Uh, <laughs> granted that we allow, for example, the Department of Philosophy to use uh, a critical field of education as a basis of policy for promoting and assuring quality education. How would that work? How, how do we translate inputs from critical theory into policy statements or policies and quality that can be embraced not just by philosophy or any allied courses, but all other disciplines in the university? So, you know. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh... Mr. Ofra. <laughs> Nagpa-practice na ako, Hunos. Baka maging Ofra ko ba? Angay, angay. Nakatakot. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that, Jovi. Uh, thank you for those questions. I like, uh, uh, yung una, actually, I wanted to respond to Jack uh, when she said that. Not because I disagreed with her, but because I think we need to flesh that idea out further. Uh, kasi, yes, uh, sa, ang sinasabi kasi niya, we should also be um, responsible or uh, ano yung word na ginamit niya? Uh, accountable to our students. Parang ganon. Uh, yes, I agree. We're always accountable. Kaya nga, uh, I, I think being accountable too is a political act eh. Uh, what kind of accountability are we talking about, right? Uh, uh, kasi ang accountability na, na nangyayari, eh, accountable ka dahil nakapagbasa ka ng mga, mga syllabus mo. Once you've submitted those documents, account, okay na, you've uh, marked that box already, of uh, mark, mark, uh, that box on accountability. Diba? Parang uh, na, nagawa mo na yon, wala ka ibang gagawin. So, uh, um, uh, uh, and then uh, the idea that uh, maybe if we uh, make use of accreditation as a way to uh, see ourselves, no? but it's also a kind of mirroring process, no? a kind of self-reflective self uh, critic critic critical process i agree with that but nothing gawin yon pero hindi that's not what's happening yun ang critic criticize naman natin eh hindi yung self criticism or hindi yung maitutulong ng uh, ng assessment no uh, sa atin kaya lang kasi that's not what's happening what's happening is that we are uh, um, racing for phantom badges no there were we're racing for uh uh logos we're racing for branding we're racing for uh ang tag dito yung ang tag mo doon yung uh i call it again yung stamp we're racing racing for stamps we're not racing for self ano we're not racing for self uh uh for uh, parang self fulfillment or self um uh 
the word that I want to use. So, parang um, it's a kind of self fulfillment that's brought about by the satisfaction in your work. Parang ganon. Ah, uh, because actually we don't need to do that. Pagka ang gusto lang natin mga badges, hindi natin kailangan magseryoso sa, sa research natin. Hindi natin kailangan magseryoso sa sa mga tinuturo natin. Hindi natin kinakailangan maging seryoso sa paniniwala natin. Ah, uh, na kung are ah. Uh, 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 sa mga moral obligations natin, hindi natin kinakailangang seryosoin yung mga yan. Kung ang, ang laro lang naman na, na gusto nilang laruin natin, eh, yung makakakuha, yung makaka uh, kuha ka agad para sa university ng mga phantom badges na yan. So, that's precisely what we are criticizing and what I'm criticizing. is not I'm not criticizing uh, um, Uh, um, dito. Baba, yung, yung, yung self-reflexive uh, process ng, ng self-assessment or assessment. Pero ang kinikriticize ko yung obsess, obsession natin precisely sa, sa, ano, sa, sa accreditation, sa, sa lahat na lang ng siguro 95% ng meetings natin uh, will be about accreditation. No? Saan na yung ano? Pa, pa, ano na yung pwede natin mapag-usapan pang iba kung yun na lang ang pag-uusapan natin. Ang diba? uh, ginagawa lang nga natin sa, sa department natin, eh, kaya nga pagod na pagod tayo kasi on top of those meetings, kailangan pa natin ng mga ganitong mga activities para lang mapunan yung pagkukulang nat, ng, ano natin, ng proseso natin. Uh, kaya pagod na pagod tayo, we're deflated, we're ano, kasi nga, uh, dapat yung energies natin eh naka nakatuon lang talaga sa philosophy sa at sa pagtuturo natin pag pag, pag research natin pero, pero hindi merong mas malaking porsyento yung ginugugol natin sa uh, uh, preparations for ISO for accreditation and so on so that's the part that we are that I am critical of uh, pero kung self assessment lang yan Siguro ang pinaka malapit na nasa na, na pwede nating uh, banggitin ay yung self assessment ng CHED ng ano ng uh, uh, Center for Excellence. Yun okay lang yun. Kasi it's not imposed, it's not uh, yung uh, yung ano uh, uh, although ano rin yan uh, ang in, in, nagiging imposition na rin yan ng ng university. Kasi gustong-gusto ng university yung mga ganun eh. Yung nakalagay sa logo, katabi ng logo, yung mga ipat ipang mga ano, mga awards or mga ano. Ba 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 bakit? Bakit natin ginagawa yun? Uh, para ma-attract, para makapag-attract tayo ng ano, ng mas maraming sudyante, para ma-attract natin yung ano, yung Uh, mga mga magulang para sa UST sila mag sa UST nila enroll yung mga anak nila. Uh, so uh, mukhang yun yung ano no yun yung uh, uh, motivation no? It looks like that's the motivation. No? So the motivation is for lack of a better term, the motivation is profit oriented. It's 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 ano, it's uh, Uh, so you need, uh, so I I don't disagree with Jackie uh, pero uh, uh, we have to flesh it out further kasi it's not about I don't think she is she's uh, referring to the wholesale din embracement of the of the ideology of quality management I think what she's saying is that We, we can actually participate in the healthy type, the right way, the right type of quality assurance, but not this one. Sa tingin ko, doon siya, doon siya nanggagaling. Uh, so I don't totally disagree with her, but um, I, I, yes, there should, be, uh, uh, there should be a continuous conversation about it. And then yung next na question mo about, ano pa yung ulit? Uh, yung uh, paano natin... Um, okay. Yeah, actually, I'm not really proposing that uh, critical theory becomes um, a framework uh, for uh, conceiving an alternative pedagogical policy. 
hindi naman hindi ganoon uh, parang uh, first uh, siguro first level noon uh, Adorno provides me with some uh, conceptual tools to describe what i think are the pathological tendencies of current of the current educational system which is uh, this uh, disregard for the cultivation of culture yung maturity ng students hindi ano puro lang naka yan uh, it's all about the syllabus uh, the format even just the format of the syllabus mga ganyan and then yung ethical ano nga yung ethical maturity ng mga mga estudyante uh, uh, i don't know how kung kaya i I, hindi, hindi ko sinasabing yun dapat yung framework. Ang sinasabi ko lang, siguro, eh, uh, it, sa tingin ko ito yung mga fundamentals na nakakalimutan natin. Uh, ito yung mga, sa tingin ko, kailangan nating, uh, hindi natin maituturo directly yun eh. Uh, pero nasa pamamaraan ng pagtuturo natin. Regardless of whether we are teaching philosophy or science or or, or engineering um, or nursing, uh, sa tingin ko nasa pagtuturo natin yun. Uh, for example, we just ask ourselves, bakit yung mga nurses, andito naman si JV, baka pwede natin tanungin sa kanya, bakit uh, majority of our nurses opt to go abroad? Right? Bakit hindi sila... Uh, of course, there are obvious uh, answers uh, to that. Pero bakit ganun yung laging decision to go out and to ano? Um, so I won't go kung nasagot ko yung tanong, uh, Jovi. Pero uh, hindi naman sa uh, gagawin nating uh, parang polisiya rin yung critical theory. As a matter of fact, that's far from the... the um, the intention basically what i'm just trying to do is to use some concepts from adorno as as a kind of philosophical lens to critique you know, the current situation and in a way also uh, reminding us of what are the things that we should pay more attention to uh, in teaching uh, kaya lang kasi yun yung mga bagay na hindi natin napagtutuunan ng pansin uh, well, well, I asked I ask that question, sir, because may may agenda rin ako ron. <laughs> yung <laughs> pinag-iisipan ko po kasi yung yung teaching and research excellence framework. Mm -hmm. and, ah, okay, okay. Uh, sabi ko, saan kaya kukuha ng basis for policy inputs except from philosophy itself? Mm -hmm. At anong Anong philosophy kaya or who is the philosopher that can help us just in case we reach that point that we need to formulate policies that can be shared with all other institutions doing research and teaching philosophy. At ang iniisip ko, kung, kung sakaling ang magmamaterialize yun, it has to be an alternative to what is existing. At yung existing nga ngayon, sabi nyo nga, these are policies that are quite obsessive. obsessive. Pero sa tingin ko, um, uh, kung intindihan la, basahin lang natin, intindihan lang natin yung sistema ni, ni even Aquinas, eh, hindi natin kailangan, uh, di ba, hindi, hindi, yun, hindi kasi natin pa na so flesh out yun eh. Baka nandun mm. na rin yun eh. Baka nandun mm. na. As a matter of fact, I was supposed to mention uh, uh, earlier uh, na mas mas radical ba nga ang medieval medieval university kaysa contemporary university when you were say, saying something about yung mm -hmm. uh, ano uh, yung medieval times uh, ano uh, ang tingin ko mas radical pa ang uh, ang kaya nga naka-produce sila ng Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm. kasi mas radical mas mas nangibabaw dati yung academic freedom Kaysa ngayon. Yeah. Plus yun nga po, yung they are more open and tsaka willing to make their uh, make a public position on their uh, in the name of their disciplines. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, and it's a practice. Uh, Anyway, uh, one last po ito. Dahil okay, ang, sige, sige. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yung pong sinabi ni Sir JB kanina na para bang uh, in your presentation kahit pa paano you were able to para bang bring to the limelight ulit yung position ni Kant or Kant's uh, perspectives on ethics vis-a-vis -vis education. Pero doon din sa in your presentation, you also somehow bent back to Arendt, di ba? And yes. Arendt's uh, yun nga, report on Eichmann in, in Jerusalem. Uh, Siyempre with, without offense to Bromi. Pero <laughs> ang basa ko kasi doon sa... Anna Arendt's report on Eichmann is a very, very subtle rebuke of Kant and uh, at Kant's perspective on duty. And, it, uh, yes, okay. It could be, uh, 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 it could be uh, a critique also uh, of Kant by extension, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But primarily, mm -hmm. is it's a critique of the the misconstrual or misinterpretation of people like Eichmann mm -hmm. of the categorical imperative. Uh -huh. uh, kaya nga, uh, after saying that, Arendt, si Arendt mismo sabi niya, this is how Kant should be read. May ganun siyang mm -hmm. after that, mm -hmm. uh, after mm -hmm. that uh, uh, criticism leveled against Eichmann, she said something about how to interpret uh, um, the categorical imperative. Pero, uh, any theory kasi, uh, Kant or maskina yan sina Aquinas or Nietzsche these are all susceptible to vulgarizations no and misinterpretations at napakadaling uh, napakadali kasi i-interpret yung kay Kant eh Nap uh, napakadaling ma-misinterpret ma yung kay Kant na moral imperative so para is it just a blind obedience to duty but again what's the content of duty mm -hmm. Kaya nga, uh, the, 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 that's one of the uh, one, one of the intellectual parang anecdotes uh, when we read the intellectual history of German philosophy nagkaya nagkaroon ng, ng Hegel and before Hegel the free romantic tradition the early German romantics uh, and then uh, even before that, nandun si Fichte, nandun si na Haman criticizing Kant precisely dahil may mga pronouncements si Kant na parang, yeah, par parang may kulang eh. Parang ganun. For example, yung, uh, well, they were, they, they zeroed in his aesthetics, pero actually, he, they, they were also critical of his uh, uh, moral philosophy. Kasi, yun nga, duty. But what is duty? Where, where is the where can we find the, the normative uh, uh, foundation for duty? Saan nanggagaling yung duty na yun? So kung yung duty na yun eh, sinab, uh, eh nanggagaling sa isang uh, fear, uh, eh di yun ang susundan ng mga tao. And then, uh, madali, ma, na, madali na sa kanila dahil sa isipan nila, okay lang yun. Um, so for example, if you, ha, if you have... Uh, uh, parang a troll farm no na, nakaka, yung yung trolling na yan nakakasira talaga sa ano uh, sa point of view ng mga trolls they're just doing their job parang ganun siguro yung sinasabi ni Aren mm -hmm. uh, and then lastly uh, yung kay Kant naman uh, yung kay Adorno Adorno actually is very selective when he invokes Kant um, pero uh, one of the uh, things that he that, that he agrees with uh, e, yun nga yung idea of of mora of yung maturity and your duty to the community yun so um, that's something that um, I want to not not can't per se but yung Adorno na yun, kasi I think that's something that's that has been missing in my reading of Adorno yung normative uh, uh, foundation. No? Kasi ang laging sinasabi nila, wala, uh, ado, uh, the first generation, i.e. Adorno, uh, are, uh, Adorno was unlike Habermas and Honet because you know, Adorno didn't really provide 
us with normative you know uh, uh, resources for for uh, kung ano man yung pinaglalaban niya parang gano'n. so unlike uh, Habermas na may communication and like Honet na may recognition um, I think yung educational maturity is some is a is a, a possible candidate for that Okay sir, maraming salamat po. Thank you, Jovi. Thank you, Dr. Marami pa, marami pang magtatanong sige. Oh, I think we can still entertain another question uh, from Sir Teng. Go oh, ahead. Sir Teng. Entertain na natin lahat. Ah, okay. Sige. <laughs> okay. Doc, sa akin po, good evening po pala, Doc. Thank you for the for the wonderful paper po and to everyone. Doc, yung ID I have just two points po. Ah, Uh, kung mapapansin ko kasi natin yung education po natin ngayon sa Pilipinas and siguro everywhere, no? parang ang last po talaga nung imposition ng structure, no? nung parang process of education, no? Ayan, no? sa education, and kumbaga yung ganun kalakas yung pedagogy uh, na kumbaga parang nilululo din yung philosophy na nasa loob ng ganun pong uh, sistema. Um, Inalam po, ang nakakatawa naman, and I also agree po with Dr. Zoe that uh, ngayon po may mga maluluwag na din naman po na mga ginagawa sila. Like we can evaluate the DepEd curriculum, the child curriculum, we can make it our own, we can change it, we can restructure it, we can create a story that would parang in a way challenge them yung binubuo nilang uh, ano po. Uh, pero yung nananay po kasi Dok, yung parang yung obsession nga po no, na masukat yung outcome. I think that's also one thing na problematic. No? Uh, magbibigay lang po ako ng dalawang halimbawa. Sa senior high school po kasi, meron kami subject na creative writing tsaka po creative non-fiction. No? And uh, isa po sa nakikita kong problem doon is that para bang may expectation no, yung, yung course na matuto talaga yung mga bata na magsulat ng drama, ng tula, hmm. ng kwento. Kumbaga parang siguro po isa sa problem no uh, na ma-share ko din po yung parang there's an obsession to anticipate that the students would learn would learn it even if parang when we talk about the duration of where these subjects are being done parang it's impossible like how can you for example be a writer in one term or one semester parang it's impossible and yet parang the demand of the curriculum is that the students at the end would at least learn this. No? Uh, siguro po yun po yung isa sa, actually comment lang naman po ito Doc, no, uh, about the ongoing discussions po na ginagawa natin. Kasi naghahanap din po ako ng mga pwede naming magawa din po sa senior high school. And uh, nakinig din po ako nung nakaraang talakayan with, with din po with the, uh, pinagkaroon po ng free seminar din po yung department. So uh, ito po yung ma-share ko no yung parang there's this obsession to totally see kung ano yung nangyayari sa pag-aaral pero at the same time kailangan din kasi may idea ng kapos eh may something na kapos hindi hindi mangyayari and I think that's something na hindi na accept in a curriculum that there's something within the story that will not happen and yung outcome yung para pong obsession to outcome parang demands that it will happen whereas it won't happen <laughs> in reality. Thank yeah. you, Pondo. Um, uh, teaching creative, uh, ano ba yun? Creative non-fiction ba? Or creative writing? Both po ata. Uh, creative writing po, Doc. Creative writing. Uh, well, uh, both po. in the first place, eh, for, I mean, are they, are these students already familiar or uh, with, with uh, works on, with creative works? on non-fiction or ano uh, or fiction uh, yung familiarity nila in eh, address na ba yon di ba kasi pinag kung pinipilit natin sila magsulat pero hindi pa sila na hindi pa sila na exposed sa mga ano hindi pa sila na inspire in other words eh mahirapan silang magsulat kung hindi nila alam ko ano yung pasihan or yung parang wala silang inspiration o kaya there's no parang uh, I, don't, I don't know how to refer to it i can only think of the word apprenticeship no um walang apprenticeship na nangyari no uh, kung doon sa pinakamababang levels pa lang hindi na sila na-expose sa mga ano 
mga uh, classical uh, literature uh, nahihirapan din sila magsulat di ba uh, kasi i, I think uh, uh, something to do with the uh, with the form it's something to do with the i don't know if it makes this i don't know if this makes sense i think writing has something to do with the memory also of the past no and and, and then that memory of the past can be um, learned through reading. So baka bago writing, reading muna ang ituro ninyo. Uh, pero I agree with you that not everything uh, in the syllabus should be fulfilled. Yun ang problema, that's the obsession. Kaya nga sasabi ko kanina, there's nothing, there's nothing student-centered in the uh, in the way they are, uh, you know, Uh, implementing the system. Kasi ganun, babalik din naman pala sa ganun eh. Babalik din naman pala dun sa kung ano yung nakalagay sa syllabus, yun dapat ang mangyari. Pero OBE itself is not that, it's not like that. Uh, kaya uh, yun lang ang masasabi ko at uh, Teng. Uh, I agree with you that uh, there should be Uh, a kind of sensibility to contingency no when it comes to teaching um and especially when we are teaching the humanities especially when we are teaching literature or philosophy that uh, actually that defines it that defines uh, 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 the di dialectical nature of the of teaching philosophy that any discussion will leave room for 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 or leave space or room for further de development or discussion there's nothing final um kaya lang uh, kung sabi nga ni Jovi kanina merong philosophy and then uh pipilitin nating ipasok dito sa sistema kaya tawag nilang ano OBE na hindi naman OBE talaga eh, magkakaletsyo-letsyo talaga. And then, uh, ipipilit na ito yung gawin natin. Uh, uh, kaya, uh, sa tingin ko, uh, pero yun, yun lang masasabi ko for now, pero baka dapat eh, matuto munang magbasa ng mas malawak, mas malalib yung mga sudyante bago sila true ang magsulat. Uh, baka naman, pagka nakapagbasa na sila ng maayos, hindi na natin kailangan silang true ang magsulat. Thank you po, Doc. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Teng. And we have another one from uh, Dr. Montaña. Sir Bob, go ahead po. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Uh, sorry sa video. Uh, it's, not, it's not working kasi. It's okay. Uh, yung yung pinag-usapan nyo kasi ni Franz, no? yan yung study ko for this year. Eh. Mm. Kasi nakita ko nga yung conflict niyang uh, activism tsaka yung uh, government intervention. So par parehas nagwo-work yan sa ano eh, mandate ng constitution. For example, yung academic freedom, that is a constitutionally protected right. Uh, albeit vague, naman, no? Albe albeit the constitution is very vague on it. Oo nga, vague nga eh. Tapos yung ano rin, yung... Uh, Uh, yung mandate naman sa AFP to secure the land to uh, you, you alam mo yan yung it, it, it leads to to uh, identification of uh, of actions that are considered as red hmm. kaya kaya nga ano eh kaya ah, hindi ko pa alam ang sagot no basically pero i'm glad na na siya kasi uh, very delicate yung mga red lines no kasi pag nag uh, oh, 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 nag overflow yung power ng uh, AFP nagba-violate na siya ng ng isang right tapos pag nag overflow naman yung academic freedom pwedeng nagba-violate na rin siya ng right so magandang question yan no? pero uh, siguro by the time na magtok ako sa December baka meron na akong konting sagot diyan. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a question no based sa, sa lecture uh, mo pao. 
yung ano yung notion ng, ng tyrannical government kasi for example yung nangyari kay uh, Eichmann ah uh, di of course uh, categorical imperative dung uh, nung nanure na, na hindi pa Nuremberg trials nung nahuli siya nung uh, 60s no tapos nagkaroon ng trial sa Israel he was uh, justifying himself na is a good soldier gano na uh, na sinusunod lang niya yung uh, agreement nila sa Banse conference etc so kaya lang kasi na, na, nangyari yung lahat na yun after the defeat of Germany. It may have happened na hindi naman natalo ang Germany. Let us say na conquer ni Hitler ang, ang Russia and the entire European continent eh, uh, is under Nazi power up until now. Magiging hero yan si ano. I mean at least within the perspective of the of the, of those who, who belong to the uh, Nazi regime. So, ang, ang, yung word no na tyrannical government is just is that just a ano ba siya? Is it a a symbol of na a, a symbol of the defeated? Kumbaga, characterized lang ba siya na a ah, tyrannical yan? Kasi talo na siya eh. So, ikakategorize siya mm-hmm. as tyrannical. Pero If at the end of the day, during the time that they are still in power, hindi siya kino-consider as okay. tyrannical. So, yun. I, I think, uh, uh, siguro yung brand na uh, tyrannical uh, was not only uh, given to Nazi Germany after their defeat in the 40s, no? Uh, even before, kaya nga may alliance against them. Kasi nga, they were... Uh, b- b- already Hitler was already a, a, a known t- uh, tyrannical ruler. Um, so uh, another example, perhaps, eh, di ba? although of course media plays a very crucial role here. Uh, uh, they describe, for example, yung uh, North Korea. Eh, yun na yun na yung ano di ba yun na yung description ka agad sa North Korea but North Korea is a still a very strong state uh, pero most if not all of us would already refer to North Korea as a tyrannical state um, uh, so um, siguro um, hindi naman kinakailangang matalo yung isang ano isang state or isang tyrannical government uh, or, or government uh, for it to be dubbed as tyrannical. Um, uh, and then uh, yung, yung, yung justification na Eichmann, I mean, kung nanalo yung, kung nanalo, for example, ang, ang Germany, just in case, but of course, uh, during the time with, with the circumstances, imposibleng manalo. Pero, kung nanalo for the sake of ano argument kung nanalo kuminsa edi eh all the more that uh, they would celebrate uh, a vulgar interpretation of Kant and if and more than Kant they would probably celebrating a vulgar uh, interpretation of uh, Nietzsche's will to uh, idea of the will to power um, um, kaya I don't know kung ay satisfactorily para sa akin hindi naman siguro Uh, y- yung word or or y- yung y- yung yung category ng t- tyrannical eh y- y- parang ina-award mo sa isang ano defeated na na state or government i i think uh, part also of the um downfall of that of of that state is precisely because at its very core it's or it's all it's already tyrannical um And in history, yun din usually yung nangyayari. No? Um, tyrannical governments uh, actually cause their own downfall. Uh, y- y- yung lamat nangy- nangyayari from within their ranks din. Uh, ang, ang, ito lang nga, itong North Korea eh, is a different monster altogether. Maybe uh, 
Uh, sino ba yung nauna sa tatlo si Kim Jong Ul ba? Uh, they he, maybe the, the first two no uh, 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 did something right, right? Um, so uh, so yun lang ang masasabi ko uh, for now. Uh, Doc Bob, I don't know kung that is satisfactory. Sige, okay siya. Salamat. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Bob. And thank you, Sir Bulanos. Uh, do we have any other questions or any follow-up concerns or insights? Parang nagtaas na kami kanina si Sir Renil. Ah, Sir Renil? Oh, sige, baka last, last na ano natin. Sige, Sir Renil. Kung nandito pa siya. Sir Joby na si... Magandang gabi po. Hello? Yeah. Asensya na po. Magtatanong pa ako. No? Um, hindi ko na sir i-on yung video ko po. Para mas ano yung wifi. Um, medyo mababaw lang po yung tanong ko. No? Medyo mala... Hindi kasi mabigat yung case Sir Jovi. No? Pero nung sa introduction nyo sir, nabasa nyo siya ng medyo mabilisan. Um... Nabanggit niyo po si Tim Breza. So, ang naisip ko parang meron kang talagang parang goal to engage with with parang Filipino appropriation of philosophers, for example, of Eric Fromm. Uh, tapos, sir, pinasend niyo po yung different chapters. Nakita ko na, I think yung iba ay nagpublish niyo po sa, sa Kritike, sa, sa, I think, iba sa Budhi, about justice, about art. Then eventually po, pagdating sa conclusion, you talk about parang a critical Philippine education, etc. So, of course, uh, parang given naman sir na you are criticizing Philippine society here. No? Parang you're doing um, a critical theory of Philippine society. So, ang tanong ko sir ay, um, nung bang ni-revise yung sir yung mga chapters na sa book, papunta doon sa last part, eh, did you parang attempt to also engage with Filipino literatures or writers no, who wrote about the topics no, na, nila, na nilagay niyo po sa chapters. No. Uh, for example, you talk about parang sa last, last chapter, parang prospects about, about radical democracy. Uh, meron po ba kayo doon na parang... Mer- of course, nabasa ko yung sakritik. Eh, pero nung ni-revise niyo po ba ay did you parang add na parang engagement with Filipino scholars who wrote about radical democracies such as for example si Mabolok and Imbong or for example dun po ba sa criticism niyo sa education um, naisip niyo po ba makipag-engage let's say sa authors such as Lumbera, Guillermo or Lanuza then sa critical theory in general with Sir Okay, Pilapil, Hermida kasi ang understanding ko sir ay yung self-criticism is also parang must always must also be followed by engagement by engagement with the resources no sa, sa academe and i think engagement is also an ethical activity or an ethical gesture so kaya ko sir na tanong kasi baka ako sa bandang dulo po um, although hindi ko napakinggan lahat yung sa last part eh meron din kayong attempt to also self criticize critical theory itself na ginamit yung lens no to present kumbaga uh, theoretical framework sa buong libro no so I hope that makes sense, sir. No? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rainier. Rainiel. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the motivation of the book is to... Actually, it's a collection of the essays that I, I wrote in the past decade and a half. Uh, ibig sabihin, uh, these are my humble engagements with... Uh, diff- with uh, well, at least three no? Dom, dom, dominant uh, themes in critical theory, uh, uh, which are um, ethics, justice, and recognition. So um, uh, I did not really engage uh, thoroughly with uh, local authors because it, that's something that I'm doing also in my other projects, uh, not necessarily in this project. Uh, kasi ang purpose ng ng tong book project na ito is to uh, bring together no to somewhat systematize a bit 
not thoroughly systematize it, but just to bring and make sense of what I have written so far uh, in the past decade. Uh, so the themes uh, the, the themes on ethics, justice, and recognition are the most prominent uh, uh, themes that I engage with. Um, uh, uh, yung, in, in some way, in some, in some of the essays, I engage uh, with some authors, but not thoroughly yet, not thoroughly yet. Uh, I mentioned them in the introduction. I actually mentioned some of their names. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, Timbresa and Quito to contextualize what I mean by uh, the crisis of misappropriation. Uh, so, uh, and then, um, parang, actually, I, I believe that this, this is an ongoing project. No? It is an ongoing project. And another thing, uh, there there are many ways to engage with uh, your contemporaries. No, uh, uh, I I try to do that perhaps through uh, conferences or or workshops or or seminars. But uh, also, itong current research ko, I am dealing with local five local authors who write on critical theory. So, um, although that project is more of uh, an exposition than critique, um, uh, but it's a starting point on my part to engage with uh, local uh, authors. Um, but I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you that, uh, well, the book is, yes, it is, it is on critical theory, but um, at, uh, there are essays that are polemical, but most especially the last essay is uh, quite polemical. Uh, the, after, the afterword of the book is quite polemical. Um, but these are basically parang, ano to eh, parang humble, my own humble, uh, even personal engagement with some themes in critical theory. That is somewhat, uh, ano rin sila, it, they, they also reflect also the current uh, intellectual or academic situation in the Philippines. No? Uh, uh, yes, it, that's something that's, that's in my mind to, to, cut, to, to uh, perhaps come up with a book later on that actually engages with, uh, with local authors, no? not only um, uh, via exposing them, but also uh, uh, criticizing their, their works, no? Kung, kung kinakailangan i-criticize. Um, kaya, in a way, even if the book is already uh, being reviewed for publication, it's still a work in progress, meaning it is part perhaps of a bigger, more ambitious project, no? Uh, kaya lang kasi yung project na yan, hindi na lang yan di isang libro, parang and madami ng ano yan marami sanga-sanga na yan iba-ibang if not books eh siguro uh, public engagements if not public engagements eh siguro mga articles kanina so the, the, yung yung mga engagement that might come in different forms okay salamat po sir Pao. thank you thank, thank you dr reyes and i think uh that concludes our work in progress for today. We are grateful to our two presenters for today. Thank you, Dr. Aguas and Dr. Bolaños for the yeah. edifying presentations for our first work in progress seminar. And thank you to our VIP organizers, Anton, Paula, and Dr. Pao himself, our program lead, and Dr. Carino, our department chair. We would also like to thank everyone who participated and asked questions and who also attended today's work in progress seminar. We will have more for the sessions this term, so stay tuned. Visit and like the USC Department of Philosophy Facebook page to be updated with the upcoming work in progress seminar schedules and our department events. And if you're interested in our previous seminars and webinars, you may also visit the Critique website or the Critique Metaphorica YouTube page. Thank you again, everyone. Bye po kayo and keep safe po sa inyong lahat at inyong mga Good night, everyone. Salamat. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, good night. Salamat.
Salamat po.